All right, I think we are at 10 a.m. So I'm gonna go ahead and just get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Distributions Microconference this morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Laura Abbott. I am the organizer of this. And before we get started with the actual content, I just have a few quick slides to go over for plumbers. Uh, first, we would not be anything without our sponsors. Uh, so thank you to all the companies up here who have taken the time to give us money so we can have amenities such, such as AV recording and all the snacks and everything and all the evening events. Uh, this is just some useful information. If you've ever been to a Linux Foundation event before, Wi-Fi is the same as always, LF events, same password, Linux 1991. Uh, we do have a code of conduct just here to make sure everyone has a good time. Please review it if you have any questions. Um, if you have any, the information up there is about there who to contact if you have any issues. Uh, please get in contact with a member of the Linux Foundation staff or anyone else you, you need. Okay. And as far as actual content goes, we do have a schedule online. This is one of multiple tracks that we are going to be going over uh, today. Um, Morning sessions start at 10 a.m., as you notice today. This will be the same thing every day. Uh, lunch will be available in the restaurant ground floor for uh, 1130, 3 p.m. And there are a couple of evening events. Um, there is a welcome reception tonight. Uh, Tuesday night, you're on your own. And then Wednesday is our closing party. Okay. Uh, track owners, this is me. I am one of the track owners. I am running this microconference. Uh, and for everyone else who is pre presenting today, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to pre present a topic. It's really the topics that make uh, plumbers what it is, and without contributions, we wouldn't be our topic. And just a reminder to please make sure you're going to be uploading your slides to the OPC website. Um, there are ether pads available. I am a little bit behind <laughs> with things of uh, distributing out the ether pad links. Um, would anyone be willing to take ether pad notes? <laughs> Don't all jump in, up and down at once. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and work on the ether pad notes. And uh, as you noted, the things are being recorded, so uh, videos will be available after the conference. And then if you do have any ideas for last minute buffs, uh, please get in contact with me or one of the other event committees and we'll see if we can accommodate you. This is mostly just a chance to get together in a last minute room. Okay, and then any other qu uh, questions or complaints? Uh, these are the people you should talk to for any and all complaints or ex how excited you are to be here at Linux Plumbers. I'm on one of them. You should make sure you give everyone else, uh, let them know your opinions as well. So, okay. Are there any other logistical questions before we get started? Also, just as a, with my Linux Foundation tab me member hat on, you should have received an email to vote for this year's Technical Advisory Board. Please take the time to do that. This is important for a lot of dis different reasons. Okay. Okay, I'm done talking, and now we are going to get to the actual content. So, uh, Bruce, would you like to come up and get started? Oh, yes, thank you, Kate. Um, They are? Okay, this one is on. This one doesn't, okay, they both are on. Okay, so for those who haven't seen plumbers before, these are our microphones for the audience. They are throwable, throwable microphones. Um, please be gentle when throwing them, but you can gently toss to something. Um, hey, Justin, you wanna catch? That's how they work. And uh, also, just a reminder that uh, the purpose of plumbers is discussion, so I'd like to encourage everyone to make sure you're asking questions and wanting to, to get engaged, because um, we really want to make this the best possible option for everyone. I'm done. 
All right, is that now? Okay, it is working. Um, yeah, I got the uh, first slot, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I, I, I was, well, this is a, move it down. There, is that still picking me up? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I was going for the longest um, title as well as, <laughs> as I could. Well, I actually didn't know it was going to show up on the schedule like that, or I probably would have uh, tried to shorten that uh, a little bit. But um, uh, on the, 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 the first one I dropped it here, it says, you know, upstream first, and then it, well, all the stuff about the tools of juggling fixes and things. And, of course, if everything was upstream first, my talk would be done right now and I could sit down. So that's why I put that in the, uh, in the, in the, in the title. So what I'm sort of the problem I want to talk about is um, um, I've been maintaining different product and, and distro kernels since 2005. Uh, I've done it from the point of an operating system vendor embedded at Wind River. I've been maintaining the Yocto project reference kernel since the Yocto project kind of started working with uh, open embedded and now I'm with, as of the end of January, I'm with Xilinx, so that's a, a semiconductor. So I've now seen um, pretty much everybody's point of view on uh, kernel maintenance. So, And you know, I have a, a development background and I still do that most of the time, so it's sort of a 30% maintainer and 70% developer. So I, I have to not only maintain kernels that are, are built and distributed, that they have to be able to be um, support people doing development with them. So there, that's a different angle on potentially about the, the maintenance. So what I'm sort of the, the, the problem statement and the thing that I'm looking to talk about in particular is that um, it's about tools and workflows and, you know, is everybody else just doing it through brute force, sort of like, <laughs> like I am? Or is there anything we're missing or is there, you know, anything that, uh, that, that can be done? So, you know, what, what I have to do and what I support when maintaining a, uh, the, the kernel for, for Yocto in particular and Wind River before, a little bit less with uh, a Xilinx is, you know, there's multiple um, active kernel versions sort of in a, in a, in a branch, in a, in a release. So it's a, and there's multiple in any given, you know, active master branch. And then there's three or more old versions of the release thing. So, you know, of, of varying uh, length of the supporting. So it's multiple uh, kernel versions, not all of them. <laughs> but many. Um, it's not just a single architecture that we're supporting, so it's, uh, especially at Yocto, it's, you know, six, seven and counting architectures that we have to make sure we're, uh, are supported. Many, many different boards, um, you know, they have to have development and extension capabilities, um, and that we're, you know, depending on the, the version of the kernel and what's going on, we have thousands, you know, I think one point at Wind River, it was 10,000 different commits that, that was a delta from the mainline kernel. It's not as bad now, but, uh, um, you know, so there's, you know, features from the various boards, the semis, there's outer tree functionality if you say you're, you're supporting preempt RT or AUFS or something like that, and then in-house development. Um, and that also the flexibility to support, you know, fundamentally different features. So I've had to support everything from small footprint builds, uh, real-time extensions, uh, carrier-grade Linux, industrial containers, virtual aid, all in the same uh, kernel tree. Um, and of course, I threw this in. The problem is a small team, because usually at given times, I am the whole team uh, doing this, uh, uh, both the uh, maintainer activities and then uh, the builds and supporting, supporting the kernel. So that's the sort of the, the scope of the problem that I have to, uh, that I have to deal with uh, in, in, in sort of my day-to-day. -day. And the, I guess, this might be backwards, but the, the goals of the intended solution to that problem is that um, the changes are easily visible on, in the kernel tree when you're building it or when somebody else is building it if, they're, uh, if they need to extend it. So these changes are, are, are tracked over time and they're visible and that patches and features are um, uh, carried forward continually with at least uh, two releases a year, uh, two formal releases. And, and what I mean by that visible changes is they're not buried through 52 octopus merge commits way down to the bottom of the branch and you can't actually easy dig out what's, the, so there, there needs to be a way for people to quickly see the, the patch queue, not just um, the changes in the tree. Um, any sort of workflow should encourage open development and, and the mainlining of changes. 
Um, there has to be a common feature set across these different kernels, a common configuration. And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's where in, in, in Yocto we use these uh, kernel configuration fragments rather than uh, 52 or more different def configs that we have to, to juggle. Um, you know, and the one that I like is development and end users are equally supported. Does somebody just want to boot it or does somebody actually need to do driver development? Um, and not developing some sort of custom set of tools or workflows, right? It needs to, um, trying to change somebody's kernel workflow is nearly impossible and it's not, <laughs> I might as well tell you to use VI or Emacs and, uh, you know, make you choose. But, uh, uh, so, you know, standard workflows and tools need to be supported and it's write as few custom things as possible and all that. And I say you have to have a, a predictable release stream. So that's the, the goals of any, um, any solution to the, the, the problem set. So my observations are, you know, I've been doing this for a while and everybody gets head down working on their own project and releasing the kernel and going through their own problems and that there's a lot of common goals with all of the various kernels, but very few similar, <laughs> I put identical, but even similar tools, workflows or maintenance models. Um, the plumbing is the exception, right? Most people are using um, some set of low level uh, tools that are the same, but not really the workflows and how they management, how they release it, how it's tested and debugged and, and released. Um, you know, there's a lot of maybe little known, and that's sort of one of my goals, the little known tools or frameworks. Maybe I'll find something that'll make my uh, life easier uh, going, you know, from this presentation onwards. Um, and everybody's doing very similar work, lots of duplicated effort. How many people had to backport Spectre fixes for, you know, 12 ancient kernels and apply CVEs and do stable updates and release them and build them, right? So. Um, you know, but there's still, it's, but it really is hard to collaborate and reuse those, um, those cues. Um, I find supporting the developer, the distribution build, and the end user, uh, it, can, it can be challenging because they have a, a, a different view on how the, you know, in, in the, the Yocta world, uh, we ship it as a, a Git tree. And, and we had multi, I had a different um, Linux Yocto per release kernel version. Uh, and that was fine for the distro builds, but the people that were building OE and Yocto were complaining about having to clone the whole kernel Git repository multiple times in the disk space it was taking up, right? So that's the developer and the end user's workflow didn't match, you know, the distro build. We couldn't care less if we were cloning another uh, copy of the kernel and building it and releasing it. So we had to adjust the trees and how it was maintained uh, to meet that requirement. Um, and I'm going to say even a small amount of overhead in your, how your kernel's used or how it's built uh, turns away some users, right? Like even if you wrap uh, the, the kernel build in a, in, in a bit bait call in, in sort of my world, uh, just the time that it takes to parse and maybe start building and to find your source, you know, it'll turn um, some users away because it's much easier just to clone the Git tree CD and, 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 and do your normal workflow. So I found even the smallest deviation amount of workhead will uh, turn some users away. And um, timing your, your release dates, customers' expectations, and uh, you know, timing LTS kernels is you know, interesting. Um, I've now missed, um, Yocto does a fall release every year, so I've now missed basically every LTS kernel. And it's the fall release that most of the uh, operating system vendors do their one year, their, their yearly cadence release on. So we've now missed the LTS kernel for four years running in our fall release, which means I have many more kernel versions to juggle because I have to do a, a stutter step in the spring when I'm releasing again and nobody's going it, to, it's, it's very complicated. So those are my observations that, you know, the, the all, trying to time all of this stuff is, is, is almost impossible. I should, I don't know, I should stop. I'm kind of presenting here without, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so we do have a little bit of time, so I figured yeah. this is maybe a, a good point for questions, comments, before you know, we get into solutions. So anyone else out there? So uh, you're focusing on just the, the kernel management and the kernel release problems with Yocto. Uh, I might understand that you're perfectly happy with the way the user space is maintain, maintained in Pokey and subsequent releases? <laughs> 
No, because I'm the guy that also has to, when I upgrade the kernel, I have to make sure all of the, even the tightly coupled user space packages work, which means I have to fight through perf, because uh, we're running ahead, we're usually doing a development, anyway, perf, system, tap, LTTNG, and all of the different, uh, and I also maintain the virtualization packages, which means I then have to battle um, uh, Docker and run C and all of those things into Shay, and they're all very unsynchronized, if you will. So yeah, it's not, there's no. The, yeah. the only point I wanted to make is, yeah, kernel is a problem, um, and user level packages that depend on the kernel, of course, is a problem. And to me, the fact that Yocto is releasing um, very frequently um, the user space packages and not really maintaining a stable version of them for any reasonable period of time makes it really difficult for folks to use that as a base uh, unless we take on the responsibility of uh, you know, maintaining whatever is snapped to uh, for some period of time. I just wanted to get your thoughts on you know, the, the viability of using Yocto for anything more than the embedded space where you build something and throw it away and not worry about it and really maintain it uh, as mostly stores would uh, for some reasonable period of time. Yeah, that's always been the model with open embedded in Yocto that you get the year from the community and then it's pretty much either your own team or you have to get it like the OSVs to do that longer term maintenance. Yeah. It's possible. I know they talked about it in ELC in San Diego. I wasn't there and we'll probably talk about that same topic again at ELCE in, in Lyon. We at Microsoft are really interested in seeing what we can do to help uh, yeah, work it, with it, the community to make sure that the, in fact Yocto could be a basis for yeah, for that, for the kernel and the user space, it's not that there's an unwillingness. It's just, it's, it's like everything, it's a resource thing. It's all possible with people that, can, that want to do the work. Thank you. Uh, so if you go back to your previous slide. A um, couple of questions. One is, that wasn't me, I don't think. <laughs> uh, one of you are saying everybody is doing similar work and duplicated effort. Is it across different kernel versions? I mean, I'm just trying to figure, or, or is it, you know, it's even the same kernel version. I so, mean, so where is the challenge in collaborating? And is it also with the open source community or just within the Yocto project? And it, like, you know, it's like I maintain, say I do the, I'm doing the 5.2 kernel. I just, we're just releasing the 5.2 kernel. And the collaboration point is everybody will take uh, the, uh, the, you know, the upstream Greg stable. So that queue is pretty obvious, right? It's sort of a collaboration point at that level. But if um, we had a system tap, bug and, and you know, I patched our kernel, but you know, Debian or Gen 2, so they, they, would have, they would have a very similar probably patch uh, running in their kernels and there's no obvious way outside of knowing to go peek at what the other kernels are doing and find their queue and see if they fixed it or Google helping you out, you search and you find it, right? So there's no, I've never found an effective way outside of going and polling, you know, the rest of the, the kernels, when you're working right at the, the tip and finding Why it. are those patches not making it to the stable tree? Well, they will, but... I mean, why aren't you the one sending the patches, I guess? We, we do, normally, but it takes quite a while for them to loop around, especially if you're on a... So the problem is, you know, we have a release window that happens now and everybody else does, and they take a little while to trickle around, like up to, you know, a month, month and a half. Well, no different than any other distro having to figure out if a kernel bug is fixed somewhere else. Yeah, I'm saying, but there's everybody's kind of rummaging around and figuring it out, and yeah. So, to your point, yes, that's the goal. Is is we, you know, either it's been submitted to stable or it needs to be submitted to stable, and and distros should all be doing that. The problem is, and it's not really, a, or it, it's not a problem in the way stable is maintained, but. Things have to be in Linus's tree before they're in stable. So you get a fix, it goes to the maintainer subtree, eventually gets into Linus's tree, and then it's eligible for stable. And Greg is pretty quick about putting them in, or half the time Sasha even finds them before you even, before it you know submitted there. Uh, so it gets there, but all of that takes a lot of time uh, for you know, especially like TVEs and things like that. Syscaller finds a bug, it hits a mailing list, CV needs to be fixed, and it's not going to land in stable for it could be a couple weeks, it could be a month. ways we worked around that is once a patch comes onto the mailing list and it looks like the right one, we pick that one. I mean, it, we know it's going to go in, as opposed to you know getting a hodgepodge of fixes in. 
and, and maybe that might help uh, you know reducing the duplicated work. Yeah, I don't even need to necessarily. We can keep talking. Okay, I'll take a, a few more questions or comments. Yeah. Hi, uh, <coughs> my name is Don Jacobs from Red Hat. I just wanted to kind of reach out and say Red Hat's trying to solve the same exact problems. We recognize the same exact problems you have. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find different ways to. Uh, we've solved these in different ways. We want to try to spread out our solution, see if other districts would like to latch on or standardize or, and stuff like that. And I'm actually going to give a talk a little bit later, kind of along the same thing. So. Um, I, I wouldn't mind reaching out to you and, and coordinating stuff like this. So, uh, yeah, don't don't feel alone that we're not, you're the only one trying to solve this. <laughs> I, I know I'm not the only. That's my problem. <laughs> yeah, but when somebody's sitting, like, like everybody knows when you're getting your you know you're getting your daily ping to fix a problem, you don't really have a, a lot of time to move on stuff. So yeah, I'm just gonna I'll just leave this slide up just for us to read, and this is sort of what we've done or what largely what I've had to do uh, in Yocto to solve to to juggle all of these things, um, and so um, I'm sure that there's other things that, that, that people are doing, and that'd be a good place to uh, to collaborate on. Hi, um, you, your last slide you showed that um, the solution or a problem solution for the problem about uh, configuration fragmentation. So how is it supposed to be? And, and this, uh, the yeah, well, we've been using since you know, since the beginning configuration fragments to make sure because I maintained at Wind River way back in 2006, um, back in the early days, say post exam queues was broken, and there was seven, there was 72 different def configs that you had to go patch to fix all of the boards. Mm -hmm. So we came up with the configuration fragments. So there's a uh, post exam queue base configuration fragment, you change the option in that one and it just, it gets obviously merged. That's where merge config sort of came from it. That, so it, you, do, you change it in one place and it goes to all of the different kernel versions, boards, be it architect, you don't have to hunt up in branches and find def configs and things like that. So that's how we solve juggling, you know, uh, def configs uh, for, our, for our kernel configuration. And that made life a lot easier because we would have release bugs with uh, one kernel out of seven, one BSP out of 72 didn't have an option on in a user space package, didn't work, and you debugged it back to this one missed uh, def config. So did you say that there was a specific fragment for POSIXMQ? It wasn't quite that fine grained, bad yeah. example, but we have a base, like say there's a base, baseline a kernel set, config. A set of features. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's features. depending on like we have one for Docker now and the, the higher level of yeah. features, but like there's a base K config K type and it turns on, you know, core support that we need to make sure is everywhere. So if something new pops up, we'll, we'll turn it on at that, in that base configuration. So like POSIX MQ was in this base K type to make sure it would always be on. I mean, that's maybe more of an embedded world problem where somebody would actually consider turning some of these core features on and off, but um, there's probably more obvious ones in, in sort of a more uh, server kernel as well that would be similar. Thank you for the discussion. I do think we need to move yep. on. So Hello, check, check. <laughs> Can you hear me? I think as long as it works. Because your line set company doesn't yeah. exist anymore. It's company. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> 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 
Oh my God, uh, how are we going to get all through all the stuff that we need to talk in 20 minutes? So what do you actually see is the curtailed version of the slides, which there's no way we're getting through, right? So uh, since it's my first plumbers, I think we'll, we'll get it right in a couple of tries. So in 2021 or 2022, we'll do the right thing. Um, uh, I have a few co-presenters for me, Anatol and Sasha, of course. Um, just a quick introduction to the Microsoft Linux Systems Group. As I mentioned, for the last 10 years, what we've been focusing on is making sure that Azure is like a great platform for Linux workloads. Uh, we've done enormous work there. Um, our focus in the last couple of years has shifted slightly. Uh, we're doing some really cool, interesting stuff. How many people here have heard of uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux? There. Cool. Well, that's a pretty... Uh, Good show of hands. So, if you think about along those lines, we've been doing, you know, our own, you know, kernel, our own sort of distro. We're spinning up really interesting experiments. On that front, we've searched for various tools which kind of, sort of, give us that, what I would say, the flexibility in addressing multiple end customer needs through a single infrastructure. And what we found is. Yocto is probably the best of the breed there, for us at least, that's what we signed. Gives incredible flexibility in terms of uh, the recipes in which we can tailor these solutions to the different endpoints using the same infrastructure. Uh, so we've been pretty happy with it. In fact, my section of the slides was talking about all the things that Yocto did well for us, which got chopped, and now we'll talk about the stuff that where we are finding, you know, what I would say, like stuff at the seams that we really need to focus on and improve as a community. So. I'm going to hand this over to Anatol now. Yeah, hi, I'm Anatol, also working uh, with Cintil and uh, Sasha and many others uh, for Mic uh, with Microsoft and uh, using uh, uh, Yocto to produce different products based on, uh, uh, yeah, Yocto builds of Linux. And uh, basically what we do, uh, Anything we, we talk about here is in the context of Yocto. Um, for example, we uh, actually we go, uh, our goal is to use the same uh, same kernel branch for different products, which doesn't work well uh, every time, uh, like all the way. For example, if having a different hardware, uh, uh, despite that we we try to have uh, to you to reuse actually every. Uh, all the, all the drivers needed from upstream. Sometimes, for example, there are uh, uh, like closed source drivers which have uh, poor compatibility or uh, a such situation where, uh, where uh, the kernel doesn't support um, a given hardware and then uh, a backport would be uh, uh, like ex if, uh, not possible or too complicated and then uh, Actually, it would be interesting if someone has a uh, similar situation. And also, a part of that is uh, um, having um, the, uh, the good and the bad of the kernel config fragments that are uh, uh, for of, the, of the Yocto system, where uh, actually the good is you, ha you are uh, flexible, you can configure uh, everything, um, yeah, every single product, every single uh, uh, image, flower, uh, uh, yeah, with diff using the, the, the merge mechanism of the kernel config. And on the other side, uh, it starts now to, uh, so I start to see, for example, the, some pieces do reverts of the previous options. Um, and uh, I, it, the expectation is that it can really get a, a forest of, uh, um, a forest of, uh, you know, uh, it, it, because, because um, if there are similar products, they, they, they could basically inherit some configuration and they can uh, reuse something. And then uh, some products have a little bit difference and they, they have to revert it, uh, revert or uh, introduce something, something different. Uh, yeah, uh, so that's, that's a difficulty that we uh, meet as well. Uh, and uh, So just yeah. on, the, on the config fragments, I think we've heard this a couple times and 
I know the upstream Linux kernel also now has support for a set of config fragments, but there aren't a lot there. What config fragments, if we were to put some of those in the upstream kernel, would you like to see? Uh, to be able to build con configuration sets upstream. Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, there was this APCI. Uh, uh, there, there, there can be some feature with, uh, with um, you know, different multiple uh, fine tuning. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, one flower needs uh, full APCI support. Another one needs just the partial APCI, APCI support. And uh, that's where we uh, actually, actually, yeah, uh, you have a choice of producing two two different con configuration pieces, or uh, um, like r uh, producing a full one and then reverting uh, some option. So it's hard to say which one would would be. Uh, I mean, this is something we've talked about before for distributions yeah. trying to get more config fragments up there. But it sounds like I mean. I, I, it, so given this has come up with both times, is that it, if maybe if we can start getting some of those config fragments submitting on upstream, because I mean, maybe if it's not necessarily at the fine, fine grained board level, but for example, things like ACPI or someone mentioned Docker, those are good examples of things that um, you try to do things, because at least from my perspective, a lot of the times what I do is I'll do a make basic make def config to get stuff set up, and then I want to do something else, like say if I could have a set of config options to do Docker mm -hmm. or other things like that, that would be really helpful. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's th if I'll think about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah. Docker is a good example as well because uh, Yocto, for example, um, uh, in, in default Yocto build disables some um, like LVM driver by default by default and and um, um, yeah device mapper I think yeah so and we have to map it in the, in the in the features actually for Docker uh, for the Docker piece of config. Uh, yeah, uh, the other part, part is uh, reproducible builds. Actually, uh, in general, and in particular, the the kernel builds, where we uh, we we got to know that uh, Yocto community works on uh, in the like in the latest uh, in the latest versions of Yocto. There is uh, work going on to have reproducible builds, uh, and there is a call to the community to fix the recipes that would might. Would that, that could cause uh, non-reproducible builds, and right now we actually uh, we don't have it. Maybe some someone has it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and the the kernel project itself, I think. Yeah, uh, we have reproducible builds at the kernel in Debian. That's uh, been something we've been working on uh, for a while. Yeah. Um, one of the the last things you need to do is is to do something like dash f debug prefix map to make sure that the uh, that the kernel builds the same regardless of which directory it's been built in. Mm -hmm. So you kind of patch uh, have have a Debian specific patch for um, no it's it's just changing the the uh, C flags. I don't mm -hmm. think we have any any actual patches to the kernels build a system to do reproducible builds. Okay, because uh, uh, another part of that was <laughs> that uh, some GCC version my GCC versions might uh, not play well with that as well. So we, they would produce some uh, additional noise in the binary which would uh, actually... Uh, uh, that is possible. One of the thing this, this compiler option is relatively new. Mm -hmm. I think what you're talking about is something like, like I know we were doing Canary stuff way back when it was a, we want a reproducible build and we went so far as to like actually tag every package version in VR binary built that was used as a build dependency of it and do it that way. But there's, that's all build system work much more than, than kernel work. Okay. Yeah, build system work, it turns out, is kernel work, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, uh, but, but when, you, when you have a U name which has a, a date uh, in there or time in there, then it would be it would be still on the pro on the kernel side, no. Yeah, um, but otherwise, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is this throwback. Yeah. Uh, there are there are environment variables you can set like k build build date or I can't remember the exact name of it, but there are uh, environment variables you can set to control the date that goes into the your name. Okay. okay. Uh, talk to me afterwards if you want the details. 
Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so okay, then uh, moving forward to or uh, is there uh, are there any other questions uh, or uh, something to add? No. Okay. So uh, uh, moving moving forward to uh, back to the Yocto context with the kernel build. What what also uh, Bruce uh, mentioned there is that uh, actually to be, uh, the way Yocto works is. Uh, it has to build all the build system before you can actually do uh, the build. So we, co we uh, come around uh, in some ways that we use the shared state uh, on that. Uh, but it's, it's always like if we, if we add or remove packages, then uh, the shared state is not, not valid anymore. So we have to cache it like uh, uh, more and more and more often and more often and then uh, um, Another part of that, if we, we, we want to produce uh, SDK builds and different product builds, and uh, that actually leads to the shared state to be growing uh, like hell, actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, because uh, the, the, all, the, all the product variants uh, are a bit different, so they are serialized uh, differently in the shared state cache. Um, yeah, and that's that's uh, so co compared to to the builds. Uh, like, for example, if I want to build a package f for I don't know uh, Red Hat, Fedora, or Debian. Yeah, so where the, the there is a jail environment with pre-built tools ready. Sure, they they are pre-installed, but um, it's still something that uh, doesn't need that a lot of effort or time time effort to to be built. So that's kind of uh, issue we have as well. Uh, um, and then in NeatRamFS is, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, some of our products uh, require a read-only file system, like read-only rootFS. And in that case, uh, and we, we want also to use SE Linux, yeah? So the, the simple solution could be like to bake in NeatRamFS uh, into the kernel and uh, make it read only actually so it's it's read only uh, but cpio itself uh, doesn't support as e linux labels uh, labels exactly and uh, th that's why uh, we have to uh, uh, yeah wh what we do is uh, we uh, we create a separate squashfs image and then put it into a neatramfs and then mount it onto a loop device then switch into that, uh, switch into that uh, image in uh, squash of a image in environment and uh, have uh, as e Linux, uh, yeah. Uh, so labels and stuff. So basically, yeah, uh, st uh, using e systemd as init and uh, where uh, the issue lay. Uh, actually, it it allows to to update more easily also the kernel. Um, uh, the the uh, it, it allows to deliver the rootfs updates with the kernel, um, and it allows. Uh, uh, in some cases, we also deliver it separately. Uh, but uh, the point on this is, with Yocto, we have to build. Um, we have to build it in the uh, uh, like a uh, in a in an embedded. Uh, Recipe, so same, the same recipe that builds uh, the initRamFS also builds the rootFS image. And that doesn't work well for some, uh, for some Flavors build variants like uh, um, WIC or if you want to build VHD or some other <coughs> image because uh, the, um, uh, the Yocto would, would think that we have, we build the main the main image as a VHD, for example, and then it will try to embed a, a VHD into the initRamFS, which which would not be supported. Uh, okay, yeah. I, um, I hate to cut this off, but I mean we are getting pretty close to time, so I think okay. we probably want to wrap up with sure. the next. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, if if there is something to add or to discuss, please uh, just uh, uh, take the mic. I mean, yeah. I, I guess my question is, is that a lot of what you're describing is. Yocto specific problems that I realize this is using Yocto to build, but I guess the question I'd raise is that what, if any, of this could, do you think could fit in the upstream kernel to support to make your life easier? 
Uh, because because th th that's the real thing is, is, is I think, is there anything yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. this is doing that we could put in the upstream kernel that would make it easier to build this for you? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure if the upstream kernel is the right place for that, but the whole conf the kernel config fragments thing, I, I think it should be standardized whether it's inside the kernel tree or outside the kernel tree. I feel that a lot of uh, different um, people are doing very similar work. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of overhead to deal with that. And I'd really prefer if it'll be handled in one place instead of distributed to a bunch of people. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Just to know for anyone, if you want the mic, just wave really loud, uh, wave like that, and I will try and toss it to you. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Don Zickis, go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Don Zickis. I'm a rail kernel engineer, uh, I guess a process monkey. I've been uh, doing a lot of rail process issues and development model over the last uh, 10, 13 years at Red Hat, uh, basically kernel related. I'm, Another kernel guy talking about kernel. I mean, people keep asking about user space stuff, but I'm, I'm going to talk about kernel stuff. And just like all the other talks before me, I have the same problems trying to get developers, make it easier for developers to develop um, on upstream kernels using our distro specific processes. So I, I'm, I like to talk about how we can incorporate standardized on solutions that we can push upstream. So, like other distros, RHEL has, has always had the problem is how do you get developers? to do distro work, you know, configs, packaging, building, testing, and all that stuff. How do you take an upstream source tree and plug in all that secret soft, not really secret soft, but distro magic on the back end so it makes it, you know, very seamless for developers to work on their source git tree and do the, uh, do the work, uh, do the builds, kick off builds, and do the packaging on the back end. And just like the talk before, my Yaku is having the same problem, Debian and everything. So, I'm here to kind of talk about, is there anything we can standardize? Is there other ways uh, we can kind of collaborate and actually push change upstream to make our lives easier from a distro perspective? So before I, I kind of move forward here, is there any distro maintainers here? Like, uh, you, know, you know, we got Fedora, I know here, I see, I think Debian, we got, I know Yaku's here. Can you shout out what, what distros you're part of? 
Ubuntu, Debian, Suze, Suze, okay. Oracle. Okay, perfect. So we got all the, the, the major uh, distros in here, the maintainers. This is great. So we're all, as maintainers, we're all solving packaging problems. And I'm sure you're trying to figure out how to get developers in, involved in, in using an up tree, upstream tree and using your, your distro uh, magic. So that, and RHEL and Fedora are facing the same thing. So one of the things we've done recently, you know, thanks to work with Laura, we've released a, we've taken a lot of our RHEL internal development workflow and kind of pushed upstream through a, uh, we call it an always ready kernel effort. Laura's made that public. And what that really kind of entails is we took an upstream tree, put a Red Hat directory there and put a lot of magic behind there and incorporate all our, our distro magic. And we're, we're uh, working on incorporating that into, into Fedora. And what that allows you to do from a top level is to do your configs, do your uh, RPM builds, um, kick off builds, kick off testing, and stuff like that. So I know a lot of distros are having the same problem. So I'm trying to figure out if there's ways we can kind of uh, come up with a, a similar situation or similar solutions that we can all take advantage of and, and push changes upstream so it makes our lives easier as a distro uh, maintainer. Some of the solutions that we, some of the issues we ran into, um, I'm hoping other people kind of relate to a little bit. Uh, I like to solve is we uh, a make file. We have there's a kernel top level make file. We have something above that in order to do hooks into our distro um, config uh, distro make file options. I'm assuming other uh, is there any other distributions who have a similar problem that they need a make file on top of the kernel top top level make file or is it just so Debian? I don't, I, uh, so you guys are all running into the same problem, right? Would 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 you be open to having uh, pushing a, a a distro a makefile.distro file up there to kind of help uh, make it easier for you to connect into your packaging? Uh, well, we actually put the uh, hook in a a makefile that goes in the build tree okay. because it has per that will have some settings specific to the build configuration that we're building. Well, did you patch it? Did you push that upstream, or how does that work? That's yeah. That we 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 have to patch that into the top level. Okay, so would it, if you had a, a I guess we could do that indirectly through a main file or distro. I know, I'm just wondering, is would that be something to make your life easier? Yes. Okay, well, but. I, I mean, our packaging is based on Debian. Everything's pretty similar to that, but we I most of our changes are. We just patch directly into the main kernel make file, a patch on top of the kernel. But uh, while you do that, it makes it difficult to maintain it going forward, right? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 that's, a, that's the point we're trying to solve, is, is that it turns out that trying to maintain patches in the kernel make file and having to patch that, well, it seems like we run into conflicts every now and then. Not, all, not very frequently, but if something changes. And the point is, is that if we can have a way that the distribution packaging can be in something that can change, but then the main kernel make file doesn't run into conflicts, and the point is, is that that changes independently. And that's the problem we're trying to solve so that nobody has to deal with that, so. So you could just add the hook inside the main make file into an external make file that'll do nothing if it doesn't exist, for yeah, example, stuff like that. Exactly. That's, is, would there be any objections to that? Would people find that useful? I mean, would people use it? Would distros use it? I mean, I think distros would use it than other people who want to experiment with stuff, so. Is it just as simple as just putting in the clue make file dot, I don't know, distro kind of a thing, and then just putting all the distro stuff in there. If it's if it exists, use it. Otherwise, ignore it. Would that be, would that work for people, or is there a better solution? Uh, Suze is, is I don't know. You guys have similar problems, or is this not even I, touching? I think that no, for the make file, no, we don't attach changes to one thing. Okay, so this doesn't even affect you. No. Okay. How are you building your uh, RPM then to package things? Are you? Totally outside of the distribution. Yeah, I guess that. <laughs> yeah, hello. I guess that we have a lot of magic in the spits file that yeah. does a lot of X around the build. So. I mean, that is also kind of a, another adjacent question to this: is that is it worth trying to? Um, I, I know each distribution tends to want to do their own magic, but is it worth trying to get common spec or dev recipes in the upstream kernel, or is it just you think that everyone is just so different, there's no point in even trying to get something that's common? Um, well, if there's no thing common, then why do we have to make RPM? 
I mean, the, that's an interesting question that you now that you mentioned make RPM is, is is that from my perspective, the reason we haven't make RPM is for is for some people who just have they want a very basic RPM that does something for your purposes of installing because it it yeah it makes an RPM but it doesn't have a whole lot of things that are complete and I mean there's a lot of things I'd want to change. So the question is is that is it worth trying to make that more complete or is it just going to end up being yet a third target that maybe gets a little bit better but it's not actually in common for distributions? Not that we shouldn't improve make RPM. But um, I mean, would, would anyone else try and find value? Um, okay. oh. Let's double check everyone's awake. I did not go for the head this time. Uh, so I, I think there's sufficient difference that uh, you can't have a common spec file, but there is also enough commonality that we should get the basics right. And, and start from there. Yeah, um, there was a big difference from, for for example, how to um, generate the debug info and how to comp compress the counter modules and so on. That is very tricky for now. So one of the things we did at Red Hat, we, we have a, a template, a spec file template, and we, we generate the, the spec file on the fly based on how the tree is configured and what options you're using. Um, I, I agree, I, I'm not sure how we can each distro has so much magic built into their, their spec file, their dev file, it might be hard to standardize. But if we can have a hook in there that helps, I know as Yocto was saying, how do you get developers to generate that spec file, to generate that dev file for you, if we put a top level make file hook to make it easier for developers to, to, to build and, and to, to tweak if they're necessary. Yeah, so that means that it's not only about the make file, but also some basic infrastructure that also in including the upstream. Which was my next point. Was oh, that, okay. Um, did you have uh, a question? Yeah, with regards to common spec files, I think it would be, would be more sense to have a, a shared make recipes that distro spec files would use rather than a common spec file because they are so different spec files, but they do a lot of common things. That's why. Well, I mean, I'm not sure that spec files and, and app definitions and all that are, are, you know, are something that should go upstream. I think that might be something that we all want to maintain and drop into a tree and then hook it, right? That. There might be enough churn, it might be hard. Is that what you're saying? That's, that's what I'm thinking is, and, and you're talking about something where, okay, I'm ready to start with a new uh, tree, so I clone Linus's tree, but then I have to go grab some stuff spool it down, do a symlink or something, right? And, that, and that's my next point is how to bring in that magic too. Okay. Um, is there any specific spec, do you, do you want do you want to follow up on your question? Or are you done? As, uh, oh, we got something else. To what you said, Clark. Uh, there, yes, spec files are something that are distro specific, but the, I think we have enough there that there can be a starter spec file more advanced than what's there for make RPM right now. And then you build off that so any bug fixes come back and distros get it for free. So I, I don't know that I've ever actually used the upstream make RPM. Well, um, I, I've used it. It needs a lot of tweaking for Red Hat stuff. Right. So I, I, Okay. I've got a couple comments. Um, okay. One, I'm, 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 watch out for the speaker. I'm not talking about the the kernel in this case. I'm talking about our the RDMA core package, which we, is user space, but we maintain similar to the, the kernel stuff. But we did ad adopt a top level distro subdirectory in the upstream package, and uh, we tried for a little bit bringing in you know, distro specs or whatever. And it turns out that there's, there's simply so much customization on each distro, really the best we could do. And this is a small, simple package, mind you, not nearly anything like the kernel. The best we could do was actually get more or less a template. But it, it actually turns out that that spec file, that template spec file is, is still valuable because as we make changes in the upstream RDMA core package, we update that spec file and we show kind of what we intended 
for you know the way the package should be pack put together, where stuff should go. It almost provides a, a template, spec template, that then gives a best practice to distros going forward so they can see the changes, how we intended them to be used and everything else. So is that, is that the way you guys are doing it now? Is yeah. I mean, all the distros start from that, tweak, tweak the template? Well, they, they pull their template into their own stuff. Now, it's not really feasible, or we found it's not really feasible to keep pushing the changes to that, right. the distro stuff. Like, you know, I mean, like for instance, you don't want an RPM change log being pushed to the upstream repository. It's just a total waste of time. So the downstream template becomes um, separate like it, it ha always has been, but then as you're moving forward, when you get updates to the release, um, certain git commits will show um, patches to this, the spec template, and so then they can turn around and take that patch and, and put the same work into their distro template, and it shows them what needs to be done and where, and that kind of thing. So that kind of worked out pretty good for us, but we were unable, even with our little package, we were unable to get a, a true distro template for each distro to go up there, which is right. just too much. I know you could talk all day, Doug. I, okay. I only got a few more minutes, so <laughs> if you don't, I'm just gonna. Hi, so, uh, speaking about spec files, maybe they are too different between distros, but something that could be done is to take um, all the commonality and use, for example, um, RPM macros and have a set of macros that the spec file for each distro could use. So maybe that's a way to have some common code, but even though every spec file is different. Yeah, my, I guess I appreciate the idea of the spec file templates. My only concern here is, is uh, someone has to sit down and look at all the spec files and try to figure out what template we can start. And we, we can go down that road if, if people are excited about doing that. I'm, just, I'm a little nervous that it, it's, it's a long and exhausting road and we, I'm not sure how successful it will be. Uh, Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, in, instead, I, I kind of want to focus on more of a high-level problem that can help all the distros. And um, I know I only got a few minutes. Sorry, Laura. But uh, if I can, I was looking at suggesting maybe like a mount point. One thing we do at Red Hat, we have a, a Red Hat directory that has all our distro magic behind it. Um, if we had the ability to, uh, if distros had a chance to, uh, it maybe from a separate Git tree, either do a Git subtree mount or somehow mount it some other way so that way they can get all their, their uh, distro magic um, all the time without having to push changes upstream, it just happens uh, on the side, or some sort of solution that way as a developer who wants to participate in that, that, uh, that distro or get involved or see what configs they're using, they can easily plug in, they take an upstream tree, plug into a distro uh, magic and, and start cranking away. Would that, would anyone find that useful? You Hi. Even. Hi, Neil. Hey, Don. Um, not really related to what you just said, but I, I <laughs> sorry, you know. I, I think it might bear pointing out that commonalities upstream for these distro specific items might just be transient and coincidental. That is to say, we might have some things in common today but there's no guarantee that the fact that they're common today will make them common in perpetuity or even for the next couple days. Um, a Debian distro might turn on a new feature uh, for the sake of experimenting with it and just making it available to hobbyist users uh, or a Fedora distribution might do that whereas a RHEL or an Ubuntu distribution will do something completely different based on the fact that a customer wants it. Um, and that's, that's not to say that there won't be commonality but the usual values that commonality brings upstream might be somewhat less applicable here. I mean, I kind of have to do disagree with that argument, though, solely be because, okay, it's true that we can't guarantee commonality, but we can't actually guarantee anything commonality upstream, is, is that there's no guarantee that anything is gonna stick around upstream. So I'd probably say is, is that if we can think that there seems like there's reasonable work using our best judgment as engineers that we would push anything upstream, I think it makes sense to try and have it be common. I don't disagree, sorry. I don't disagree with that. I, I think pushing upstream for the sake of pushing upstream is, probably has value. My, my thought just is that typically having something common upstream is based on the notion that most people plan to use this, and I'm not sure that axiom applies to this commonality. Okay. 
it would at least start a discussion upstream at that time with all the different distros if that is going to be common if they see a version when it wouldn't be anymore. Okay, I think we're just about time. So does anyone else have any last comments? Just to summarize. Hi, Don. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> I think I've got more experience managing distros than anybody else here. Uh, I think you should start with, <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> I think you should start with the config merging. Basically everybody does it. Everybody does it in a hierarchical format based on like architecture and uh, you know, some generic thing, then x86, then x86-64. Get that stuff upstream. I think that would be a really useful contribution. Uh, right now all we have is like the def configs and some of the snippet merging. Yeah, I think you should solve the, cons the distro config stuff first. I was hoping to get to that, but I didn't quite get there. But what you were looking at, and what you're trying, I know what you're trying to do from the Red Hat side of it, but it, it easily goes to the the everything side of it. Where if you have this top level directory, you have a makefile hook that looks for a makefile that distro, you can have a standard make source package command that makes source packages for whatever distro you happen to be, as long as you have that that git tree subtree there and it works for everybody. It doesn't matter what your distro magic is because you're getting your distro magic from the distro, but the commands are the same. Yeah, from a different spot. We, you keep the distro magic right. and do whatever you want to to it, but you've got a common place for it to be brought in. Yeah, but I mean, you get so many people coming into Fedora with, hey, I need to build with this patch, and how do I build with this patch? Now you have a set of documentation that everybody can use, and it works no matter what your distro is for, this is how you build your source file there. Hi. <laughs> At least the, the effect of everyone seeing that I'm starting. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Matthias. I'm uh, working for Google on Android and the London kernel team. Um, I'm fairly new to kernels, so bear with me on some of the details. Um, I always liked um, working on build systems, ABI, so that, that's my, my background there. Um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, how we try in Android to approach um, ABI stability for in-kernel ABI. I'm not talking about any user land ABI or something like that. Um, it, it's really what the kernel exposes um, as an ABI and API uh, towards its modules um, and how we approach that. Um, I know a lot of distro kernels do that for, for ages and, and have different approaches on that. Um, the Android uh, kernel builds look slightly different and um, so it, it was worth reevaluating that approach a bit um, that others might do. Um, why do we w want to do that at all? Um, so one, one major reason is um, you can't always have um, everything in tree. Um, some things are just out of tree and, and sometimes it's worth to decouple de de development of kernel and the module um, in some sort. Um, and Due to that fact, uh, you see that in the in the Android ecosystem, um, we, we gained quite some fragmentation of kernels uh, between devices, 
Android versions and those. And so we want to try to, to get back to a state where we have um, kind of a consolidated ABI, a generic uh, kernel uh, image, generic kernel interface. Um, and we want to do that through ABIs and APIs um, to restrict how, uh, what we expose um, to modules, what we expose to, to vendors to eventually actually remove fragment, or like not remove, um, decrease uh, fragmentation um, across devices, across Android versions, um, having the vision of um, only one single kernel image uh, per architecture um, as, a, as a vision we follow up. Um, eventually also supporting um, updates in, um, of, of kernels independently of, of modules of being able to. Um, so how, where, where does it all start in Android 8? Not sure how many uh, of you know, but um, there, there was a fairly big project um, decoupling um, render parts from, from um, yeah, or like decoupling vendor parts. So there is a there's a vendor interface um, which decouples all the Android framework from um, vendor parts like drivers, whole interfaces, and still everything that is uh, vendor specific ends up in this big conglomerate of, of kernel, which includes common kernel stuff that we use for Android upstream kernel, but also vendor code. So that that's not really decoupled, and that's actually what we what we try to approach that we actually also decouple that so that we have a, a generic kernel image, um, something that is common across uh, all Android devices. Uh, we have a set of modules um, that are common across um, um, Android devices or Android kernels. And then we, we say we want to expose a stable ABI and API from that set of image and, and modules um, to allow um, to vendors to plug in um, their drivers, uh, their modules. So that, that sounds all fancy, but um, apparently that, that's not something that is easily done in upstream, or it's not, not something that we want to approach in upstream, or no one wants, uh, as far as I know. Um, so how, how, do we, how can we scope that problem? How can we reduce that problem to something to make it work? First of all, um, we don't want to do that for, for mainline. We want to do that for LTS branches, so we, we want to keep ABI and API stable within LTS branches. Um, LTS branches that, that matter for us in that case. There is one question. So when you say across LTS versions, are you saying you want the same KBI for 4.9 and 4.14? No, or? within, within 4.19. So every, from basically the first released, re released um, LTS uh, Android version 419, whatever, uh, and we want to stay within that uh, within that series. We want to stay stable within that series. So we don't expect 5.x to be compatible to 419, but we expect 419n to be compatible to 419n plus one. So back when I first met Greg at Novell, the statement that you had there, right? <laughs> Uh, nonsense about uh, ABI nonsense, right? Uh, ha have we given up on forcing everybody to be in the tree? I, I think that that's, you, you can encourage people to be in the tree and you can try to get more and more stuff in the tree. Greg wants to hook in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love everybody to be in the tree. Um, talk to Qualcomm, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the real thing is we're dealing with vendors that are not in tree and that's the problem. And we're working on that independent, I'm working on that independently, but we also have to deal with the real world. Okay. That's fair enough. Okay. So is that, the, okay, so if you're try, trying to stay the same ABI for an N plus one kernel, right, uh, in the same LTS branch, uh, does that impose a constraint on the APIs that are then accepted into the LTS branch? Um, okay, good. <laughs> One more. Uh, one more thing I want to add is we also make it easier on ourselves, apart from all the things that Matthias mentioned there, is we also give us an ability to change this every year as we release Android, make Android releases. So it's within 
an LTS release for a year. So that's how we reduce the scope and make it manageable. What's easier than Red Hat have to do it? <laughs> we will change it. Uh, every year we can change it. We can do that. But within the year, we want to make sure it's the same. Yeah, I, I did not mention that, um, not to hide it, but I still hope that we can avoid major <laughs> changes there. So. Um, the second part is configuration. Obviously, we have to um, agree on a configuration that works for all the, uh, all the vendors and that part. Um, nevertheless, we want to also keep configuration stable. There is an exception, obviously, if you, if you can change uh, configuration without breaking ABI, that, that's a valid change. Um, then tool chain, we, we, we heard about reproducible build. Uh, I think we are one step before that. Um, we, are, I, I still working on, we are still working on hermetic builds, just making sure we, we actually understand all our dependencies um, because we are not building on the distro, distro we are running. So our um, people working on Android, keep people uh, building Android kernels, not necessarily running Android to build the kernel. Uh, probably they won't. Um, so we, we have all sorts of tool chains out there, older GCCs, younger GCCs. So we, we try to contain that, not only compilers, linkers, but all sorts of other tools um, that the kernel build uses, um, down to you name and, and prods or whatever. Um, and of course, we want to scope the problem. We don't want to make like everything um, part of this ABI API. We want to make sure we, uh, we, have, we have mechanisms to say this is part of the ABI and that's not. Um, so we will have whitelists, um, supposedly, and um, uh, blacklists, and we might have other mechanisms. So this, the second block is how do we do actually do that? In Android, we are only targeting currently 4.19 and 4.5x, whatever that would be. Um, we say there is one a generic kernel configuration that might differ between ARM and, and maybe other uh, architectures that we support there. Um, tool chain wise, we say it's Clang builds, it's whatever the tool chain uh, is that we come uh, that we that we come with. If there is a if there is a change in the tool chain, it has to be um, an, a non ABI breaking tool, uh, tool chain change. So we can upgrade compilers as long as we stay. Um, stable there. And from the scope, we only consider observable ABI. So that, that's maybe the, the main difference. Um, we, we don't look at code too much. We look at the binaries. We, we, we deduct what is the ABI from the binary that we produce. Um, whitelists are something we are working on, and simple namespaces is something that was recently discussed upstream. Um, to scope the to scope um, ABIs to say, okay, I'm, I am, I'm only supporting that namespace and every, every symbol that is in there. But that's a different discussion. Um, okay, we use, check the time. Uh, for, as, as a tool, we use libabigail, um, maintainer sitting here, Dodgy, you get all the credit for that. Um, <laughs> Hi, ah, um, I was just wondering if other distros actually care that much about keeping the ABI stable because we don't, Really seem to care that much. Yeah. yeah. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just us. Okay. Why? Okay. I mean, but I mean, if for, for desktop distros, though, I mean, you can always just have you know the latest code and recompile. It's not as you know, you're not as stuck on you know a certain SDK as you would be on like Android. Or ha having the code might not be the case, so I you might not have access to that code, or you might not have, um, or you might have uh, an, a third-party module that is maintained by someone who has to actually. The desktop, everyone's favorite in desktop uh, graphics driver is a for good example. example. For example, mm -hmm. if you want to ensure that that doesn't work or break everything else, which isn't to say that the developers of that can't be responsive and try and fix it, but the point is, is that if you want to guarantee it won't break, this could, that could be a way to do that. Okay. Yeah, just a very, very quick introduction what it does. Um, so Live Abigail is a, is, a, is a set of libraries and tools. Um, so mostly we use it as a, a we use the, tool that come, uh, the tools that come with it. Um, and it specifically allows uh, serializing and deserializing ABI from binaries. It does that for um, like standard ELF binaries, but it also got recently, not so recently, but recently we worked on uh, the support for the kernel. 
And rather than considering elf symbols and dwarf information to, to deduct that information, um, it actually uses the case symptom to, to follow whatever is really exported from the kernel, like export symbol. Um, and it does that actually pretty well. Um, there are some, some changes to case symptom regularly, or at least in 4.19, that broke that support a bit. Um, we have that fixed for VM Linux we are still working on, and there's a patch upstream posted, very likely to be included soon. Uh, to fix it for the modules as well. Um, basically what it does, it takes uh, either a VM Linux, a module, or a tree, and discovers then VM Linux and the modules, and creates an XML data, uh, basically a data structure in memory, but also serializes to XML, which you can actually take and compare to a previous version. So if you get the ABI, you say that that's my uh, observable ABI. You're able to compare to how uh, ABI changes uh, in a future uh, version of that binary. Um, so just as an example, um, that, that's just a bit of code. We got some Sorry. questions. <laughs> so is this, uh, creating this XML, is that something in the upstream makefile? Um, that's not part of the makefile. That, that's just basically, you build the kernel and you call a one single tool on that tree that you built, um, which is um, ABI DW. Right. It's is a tool to basically extract it. Is there any reason not to put it in the kernel build? Uh, I mean, yeah, you, ha you have to consider that there's an external dependency on the right version of that tool. So maybe similar to um, dependency on a correct version on S patch, that might be a tool that we can refer to an upstream, maybe. Someone has opinions on that, other than that? Other than yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stupid question for you. Does all the observab observable KBI need to remain stable? Or can it just? Except we have it on a, on a suppression or we say we, we don't want to keep that. So if you we, if we say that is, um, if you we, if we go the way of, of white lists, um, or if you say, I only keep that namespace or that, that group of symbols or that symbol set start with USB underscore stable, um, obviously not. So it depends on um, how you define any suppressions or whitelists or things that you don't want to have in your scope. Right, but what I'm, uh, I think they're in agreement. What I'm trying to say is that even though it's observable, ob observable, <laughs> it, it doesn't necessarily need to be stable and we can have a subset of it by blacklisting or white whitelisting. I mean, I mean, is there, is there any reason that everything needs to be stable? Everything that is observable can technically be used. So, and as we all know, whatever is exposed gets used. <laughs> um, <laughs> no matter how creepy. Let me let me ask this question in a different way. Okay. You you are looking at per very particular drivers. Uh, wireless, what, whatever it is, you can come up with that list. I think what the devil is trying to say, please correct, correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, uh, you know what that subset is. You know what that subset of system, uh, uh, KBI calls are gonna be, right? And he's wondering, can you just limit it to that? Yes, I mean, essentially, yeah, you, you know. don't want to increase your support space, right? You want to say, I want to limit this, I'm telling you exactly what I support. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. No, no, you, you can. <laughs> so, so. There should be another one, right? There is. Ah, there it is. <laughs> so, so essentially what I'm trying to say is that you don't want to increase the, the space you're supporting because, hey, your team's not very big. You can't be fixing every bug out there. All you say is, hey, this is what I'm supporting. Keep it limited um, and so on. Maybe, maybe two answers, and Sandeep will add the third one, I guess. Um, so <laughs> so our, our config is not so terribly big. Uh, maybe I'm, I've got shut down now. But um, so the, the amount of symbols is much smaller than the amount that the standard distro kernel has, like enterprise, like SUSE or Red Hat. So our, our distribution is um, uh, fairly small uh, compared to that. and. Yes, we are still figuring out um, what what ways we we find to scope which symbols we are actually keeping stable. So I hope um, that namespacing is is one way of of saying okay, we, we keep these namespaces safe and uh, stable, 
and modules have to explicitly, I'm not sure whether you followed this namespace uh, series, but modules are supposed to import these namespaces so we can actually see modules are using um, certain namespaces and we have to keep them stable uh, because they are used by our vendors. Oh, so I'll give you the third option. Yeah. The third thing, I'll, I have an example I give, keep talking about. Like for example, we don't necessarily care if a file system is a module. So if, if we narrow down everything down to all of these symbols are explicitly used by file system, like say register file system for example, we don't necessarily care about it being stable. But the problem with ABM monitoring is obviously you know this is the structures used within that API may eventually end up being used in some other API, which we do not, we do want to keep stable. So it basically boils down to the same problem. So that intersection we will find, but yeah, we can't start with, okay, this is the restricted one because once we start with the restricted one, nothing is gonna work. So we have to basically narrow it down instead of basically keep it narrow and then open it up. Because right now we have about two and a half million lines of additional code on top of us upstream LTS. So if we break, if we restrict anything, it's we know that most of the times it's gonna break. And we tried it, so we're basically keeping it open and then reducing it down. Wait. Hey, so um, one of the things, uh, one of the things that we do to keep the API uh, stable in Debian is sometimes if there's a, a change to a structure, uh, if it's just an extension to the structure, and we know that that structure is always allocated uh, in in the core kernel, and it's always uh, that that extra member is only used in the core kernel. Like we the know that that's com that that's backwards compatible, mm -hmm. right? Um, Basically, and currently with Jen when uh, using uh, the 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 symbol versioning support for ABI, we can just do a uh, well Jen sims will read through the code again. We can do an, we can use an if def to hide that. Do you have a way to um, hide those sorts of changes or exclude those sorts of changes with libabigail, where you know that the, the change is, is backward compatible? Or does it have its own ability to, to detect that? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, some, some things in, in libabigail are still a bit work in progress. Some of these things are actually supported. So some of the twists between uh, what is compatible and what is not compatible are um, can, can be detected by Abigail, and some of them cons are considered harmless, some of them considered um, an actual breakage. Um, it depends very much on the use case. I have some, some further slides to give some very limited use cases on, on how it might look like and how easy it gets arguable um, of what is a harmless change. Thank you. Um, so do you know Valgrind uh, a bit? Yeah. So in Valgrind, you have suppressions where you can suppress some, uh, you know, some, some stuff you don't want to see. Um, so in Libabigail, we have the same, uh, well, it's something similar, where you can say that, you know, uh, for instance, this, in this structure, uh, I've got a new data member that got added, but I, kn I, know that in, I know that in this particular case, because the structure was padded, for instance, this um, new data member is not uh, increasing the size of the structure, right? And so I don't want to, to have this thing flagged at all. Then you can define a suppression, just like in Volgrain, naming specifically that type and that data member saying that, okay, in this case, yeah, don't, you know, don't bark. Yeah. So I'm curious how you address things which aren't seen in the EBI. So for example, lock and semantic changes. Is there a way to represent them? Do you track them? Uh, there are some things that we can currently not track, uh, and we maybe I just jump forward like one 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 sentence. Basically, such um, such a, a representation looks like you you have the symbols, you have the variables, you have some dwarf information, offsets, values. That that that's not too surprising. Uh, I will skip over that yet now, um, and. So one, one pot, uh, potential breakage uh, would, would look like that, for example. You have a, a removed function, basically, just remove that function and um, it, it's reporting as a breakage. Um, so these are kind of cases that are straightforward. Edit function, similar, yeah. Member changes and I will go into the interesting ones that are actually, yeah, that's actually an interesting one. 
um, sorting in uh, values alphabetically because I, I just was there. Um, yeah, um, it's a breakage, um, but you can consider that an a API breakage rather than an ABI breakage. So that that's also arguable. But Abigail uh, detects that. Interesting things are like untagged enums um, that that we actually don't see in the ABI. So that is uh, from uh, Linux MMM.h and uh, region intersects returns an int, like literally the value of either of them. Um, so, and we're we not able to track that. that. That's not a symbol, that's not something that is exposed to the ABI as part of Elf or Dwarf. Um, so we are working on that, um, but it's like, if someone sorts that as well, it's unsorted in the code, so. Um, what will happen is, um, uh, what, what we can do is we actually can capture it in a, in a data structure that we can capture. Um, well, that, that's just pseudocode of how that would be exposed to the ABI, but I could imagine that, that we can work uh, on compiler passes or just code generation to actually capture these kind of things. Um, uh, whether it, it would actually also include something like log semantics, I have to think longer about that. I, I believe, but it's maybe. Difficult to capture side effects. Yes, but the, the thing is, it, there's a thin line between things that we can capture as part of the uh, ABI and things that we can, uh, that, that are also part of the ABI, API change. <coughs> so there, there's an API change that we could technically capture here as part of the exposed ABI. Um, well, I guess, you know, uh, this could actually force better programming in some sense. Maybe if you expect a lock to be held coming in, if you had an assert in your code, asserting that the lock is held coming in, perhaps this tool could actually see uh, if the assert is there or not. It depends a bit on what we can expose. Um, yes. Behind you. <laughs> so in this particular case, um, what, so if I understand correctly, what you would like to, 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 to do is to capture this, this change, right? Even though uh, the type doesn't appear in the signature yeah. of, of this function. So one thing that, okay, so just so that people understand, what we do today um, in the model that we use today is that um, we, we infer the set of types that are part of uh, what we consider as an ABI. We infer that set from, um, from the from the functions and variables uh, that are public, that have their symbols public. For instance, this uh, region uh, underscore intersect function uh, will have a symbol generated, okay? So we'll detect that. And then we'll go and, and find out the definition of this function and see that, oh, the function returns an integer, blah, 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 it takes uh, other types. And then from that, we'll integer, the integer type and the other types will be part of what we consider as an ABI. The other thing that we can do as well is to say, okay, whenever we see a type in the dwarf, even if that type is not used by a function, let's consider it as part of the ABI. So in that case, we would detect that untagged um, enum, okay? Even though it, it is not used by any type, um, by, any, by any function or variable. Yeah. Um, the reason why we're not doing that by default today, there is an option to do that, is that we explode in memory <laughs> because there are like, you know, <laughs> uh, the graph of type is, will be huge. But if you know that any type that is in any include slash Linux slash something is meant to be part of the ABI, <coughs> then we can just, you know, <laughs> suck that up into the, the yeah. ABI set. But yeah, is, yeah that what, just, is that what we want? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to just state some things that are like corner cases where we are currently not able to capture it. And it's not, it's not a trivial problem to solve that. Um, there's a question there. And I have two minutes. I would just accept the question, but go to the next slide to show the other. Oh, so like I, I have an answer other than the question in terms of semantics. The, the semantics part, because we are limiting ourselves down to LTS changes, I don't know how many times locking semantics change within an LTS change, and that's basically something that, as of now, at least we're going doing the old-fashioned way in order to figure out, see if what, so see what breaks. I don't think we have any plans, because if you care about locking semantics, you have to care about pretty much all of exported API semantics. It doesn't necessarily come down to just locks, right? 
but we will, I'm sure we will run into these cases that as you may have already, because we are starting and you guys have 10 years head, head start. But we'll see, as of now we don't have it planned. Yeah. Okay, um, I have 30 seconds probably. Um, one, one thing that is part of our process that is maybe worth mentioning is, let me quickly go there. Um, oops, that's that one. So our tooling in Android capture, like it's a build script, it's not something very interesting, but um, what we do is all these things that I mentioned before, we try to capture the tool chain, um, cross compilers to make it um, like everyone who builds that kernel gets the same result in theory. Um, we try to make that easy, so you see it's just three steps to, to actually get there, um, besides getting repo, which is a story on its own. Um, but it, that repo sync command uh, basically gives you also the tool chain and everything that you need to, to build uh, the kernel in the same way everyone does, uh, and build ABIs just to repo around Abigail. Um, and the and the build uh, the kernel build and what we then basically do um, I'm sure some of some of you are familiar with Garrett but it's not so much about Garrett it's um, whatever code review or whatever tool you have your stage changes into um, is able to actually report such a difference um, in our case uh, whenever someone uploads a change um, to the Android common kernel. Um, it runs through that ABI check and validates against the predefined uh, ABI. So in that case, I um, changed something that is obviously a breakage. In, and it, it, even if you can read that, it impacts uh, 6,000 symbols uh, indirectly um, just by the single line. And, but it also shows you very, very exactly you, you changed something, a sort of root cause being that member insertion there. Um, that's how we track changes in, uh, in Android and under Android kernels, but that, that tooling is fairly generic to be integrated in whatever your workflow or processes on, on creating new changes. Um, the thing is, everything, including tool chain changes, um, everything that affects the binary in the end, needs to run through that uh, process. Um, so you cannot just say, ah, "I update Clang and I Clang and I don't I don't care." Um, what the kernel will look like afterwards. So everything that is part of it. And that's about it, what I wanted to say. Thanks for the discussion. Okay, let's get started. So hi, I'm Guillaume Tucker. I work at Collabora. And first I'll start with a few slides to give a bit of context why I think it's important to see what kernel CI can do with distribution kernels. It's not obvious whether it's a good tool or not, so hopefully by the end of this session we'll know a bit better. So I'll start very quickly with um, some background about kernel CI. So first is a project you'll find on kernelci.org website. That started in 2015 around the ARM ecosystem to test a wide variety of um, ARM platforms and it's growing, it's been growing a lot since then, testing all architectures. And projects have been going up and down, well, at different paces through time, but now it's Looks like it's gonna make its way into the Linux Foundation as a properly supported project, so that's pretty good. Uh, but still, it's, te it's de uh, dedicated to testing upstream kernel branches. Um, and then kernel CI is also, uh, it also refers to the tool that is used by kernelci.org. And of course, there's no reason why you couldn't install another instance of it to test anything else you would want with that, um, such as a distribution kernel, for example. Um, however, what does it take to test a distribution kernel as compared uh, with upstream? Uh, so first I'll start with a few data points. I mean, these are things people already kind of know, but I just wanted to show them here to have an idea of the dimension of it. Uh, so you have, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of lines of code and thousands of <laughs> um, config uh, options enabled in distribution kernels as for Fedora and for Debian. I think just these two, of course, um, there's many other distributions. Maybe Ubuntu would be a better comparison with Fedora. I mean, the idea here is to just give a couple of data points to show that there's a, quite a big gap, of course, between distribution kernels and upstream. What does that mean uh, from a kernel CI point of view? Um, it means it's just on the edge of what the project does because while all these distributions are tracking upstream, they have a huge patch set and not all, not all of that is going to be sent upstream. So um, 
also the um, arbitrary config choice, the no, arbitrary choices made in the distro configs means that testing them is not always necessarily useful from an upstream point of view because they all have very biased choices. And the last line I put here is actually not all. <coughs> it's actually not always true about uh, higher build costs. It's because of the big big def configs. It's true. It's almost like a non mod config. But some distros have a very small uh, footprint, uh, so it, it's not always true. But that's typical with like desktop uh, or server uh, distros. There are some microphones here, by the way. If, if anybody wants to interrupt and ask a question, please just ask and I'll throw that catch box at you. <laughs> um, so the first question I'd like to get an answer for is, well, can kernel CI be used to test distribution kernels? Uh, what it can cur currently do is build an arbitrary Git branch with diff configs that are already in the branch. Um, it's possible to have some fragments to apply on top of that, uh, but nothing too advanced. And then it can test a plain kernel image, image file, directly the result of make command and store the results when it has tested them. It stored the test results as associated with the kernel revision. And of course, a diff config and architecture built, but the, um, the point that it's testing is really the, um, the revision from the Git uh, history. So what I think would be needed uh, to extend um, support for distributions would be to be able to add some hooks before the build gets started to be able to generate a, a distribution Dev config and also um, do any like pre-processing that's needed to get the source in the right shape to build the distribution kernel. Then do the build, <laughs> and after that, there's uh, packaging, of course, because instead of testing a plain image, we want to have um, a, maybe a Debian or RPM package, and then have that installed to also test the, the installed part and see how that works with the init, init run effect. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, question there. Hi, um, my name is Don Zickus. I, I was speaking earlier about stuff like this. Uh, my question to you is, what, what type of pains do you have to go through in order to get this to work in kernel CI? And what, I know you talk about what we can do to make it easier, but what's your current pains? Well, right now we're not really testing distribution kernels, but what we are doing is testing mainline kernels with a few config fragments to enable some things, like enable uh, virtual media drivers like Vivid Driver that we all have, we have a fragment I mean for your, that. your hesitation from testing distro uh, kernels is because you don't have a way to hook in? Yeah, so I looked at how um, um, dev configs are generated. And yeah, so they would need a special hook and each distribution would need something different because they have random Perl scripts or whatever to generate the dev config. So if it was in a Git tree, it'd be fine. If it's not in a Git tree, if you just want to test what the distro currently uses, there would need to be a hook somewhere, which is possible, but it's like one, one delta, one thing that would need to be added. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's what I was trying to talk to before, is like how do we have a generic hook that, you know, if you hook in various distros, make it easy for CI, you know, CI systems to just plug in and start testing. Yeah, abs absolutely. I, I was at your talk earlier, and that's one of the possibilities. Instead of changing kernel CI to be able to do that, we can make upstream have a, an option to do that, and it would be easy. I mean, if, if upstream has an option, then this. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if upstream has the option, I'm pretty sure distros will start picking it up because mm -hmm. uh, having a common infrastructure to test is much, much more useful than you imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. I, is there really any benefit, though, to testing the packaging process? <laughs> like, like, does it matter that it's an RPM versus just testing the kernel tree in the way that you do upstream? Not really, but that kind of leads into what I'm talking about next, is testing the distro kernel as part of the, as a distro OS image. And then it needs to be installed using the, the packaging. Uh, because the, the OS image becomes like a test for the kernel. And if you change something, like if you have a different version of distant or whatever, a different libc, that might exercise the kernel in a different way, and you need to keep track of that. Yeah. And that's this bit here. Yes, I'll carry on. <laughs> so I, I, there's still a lot of value in just building the kernel and, and <coughs> just running, out and running it on a setup system. Having, converting it to an RPM doesn't really help or make it harder. 
Mm. So, I mean, if I have, let's say, a, a brand new system D, <coughs> right? Yeah. That, or, that is independent of the kernel version. It doesn't matter how I install the kernel, as long yeah. as I have the new kernel. Yeah. So I'm not convinced the, the, uh, the RPM building and so on is uh, I, I think it's not. not I think not that's wishful thinking. Yeah. So I, I mean, to, to his point, it, testing it within the distro, System D in particular is one thing that, that occasionally kernel versions don't work with, ex with different versions of System D. And yes, it's a bug and it needs to be fixed, but is it a, you know, which, which side is the bug? Is it a kernel bug? Is it a System D bug? Sometimes it, there was a kernel bug that System D just assumed would always be there, and when the bug got fixed, now System D doesn't work. Things like that. So it, I, I understand the point there. So yeah, to answer your question, not always, it's not always necessary to make a package, but it opens different things. It opens new ways of testing the kernel. Um, and yeah, extra potential things may, we may want to do, so it's based on user space changes, like we just said, you know, if systemd version changes, you want to be able to retest the same kernel version, uh, but still be able to track that in the, in the back end, in the, in the kernel CR database, which is not something we're doing now. Um, and then may, there may be some more advanced like product-oriented features like running the installer, the, the distro installer, and maybe have more higher level things running from user space like open a web page or something like that and see if it calls this. It's like basically expanding what testing means. Still having the kernel as the actual thing under test, but having a, the distribution pushing the, you know, pushing the boundaries of how you test the kernel by doing more things from user space. Uh, so I don't know what value uh, distribution vendors or the you know, distribution people find in doing that, but that's a potential thing. Uh, and the challenge would be to do this, to do all these things while remaining compatible with the current kernel CI.org project. And so, you know, not turning the thing into a, a project that works just for distros and, <laughs> and makes it completely awkward to work with main, mainline. So, my yeah. worry is that if you start going more and more towards the product direction, uh, it's A, going to become complex, B, every distribution want, want to do different things. Uh, at which point in time, you know, they'll come back and say, oh, you know what, this is really specific to RHEL or to, to SUSE, mm -hmm. and, and not send it back upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, I would maybe want to keep it simpler so that... Well, if you do something that only one distro, <coughs> you know, if you can find a kernel bug that only one distro makes, uh, appear, it's still a kernel bug that you want to fix upstream. No, I don't mean kernel bugs. I mean, say, hey, you want to have the installer running and doing yeah. these hundred things. Yeah. That it, Now you're reaching a point which is fairly distro specific yes. as opposed to generic. Yeah. And so the chances of that coming back to the project are low. Yes. And, uh, and yeah. what you really want to happen is have generic infrastructure that makes people want to pick it up instead of doing their own thing. Yes, I see what you mean, yeah. So the first question was like, can, can kernel CI be used to test distro kernels? Now we've kind of looked a bit into what would be needed to do that. The next question I have is, should kernel CI be used? Like, should we make all these changes? Which leads a bit into what you are saying, like, should we actually go down these routes? Uh, so pretty close match in some respects, so not in testing, crazy distro specific things, but you know, generating a def config, packaging uh, a kernel, that's not too hard. So <laughs> by doing these things, we'd be covering a lot already. I, so, uh, yeah. so I wanna back up to that other question. So there's kind of a notion that the only people who wanna test distribution kernels are the distribution vendors, and that is not true. Uh, so for instance, at Sony, uh, we use both the Octo Project and Debian kernels in our products, and we have a whole bunch of distribution uh, testing that goes on, and it would be nice to be able to share with other people in the industry who are also do, doing distribution testing, uh, the testing artifacts or the testing you know methodologies or whatever. So I think there's bigger communities here than just the the distro vendors themselves that are interested in sharing test materials. So I I don't think I disagree on what you're saying. Uh, but you know, if, if you go saying, hey, this is something that, you know, application specific distro hook, and if the distro vendor is making it, the tendency is going to be that, hey, it's not useful to anybody else, and there's no point giving it up or sending it upstream. Instead, you know, if you were to make it as part of the infrastructure coming from upstream, 
then the likelihood of the distro adopting it is higher. Right, right, right. No, I agree with that. I'd, I'd rather see this stuff upstream instead of internal CI. Yeah, yeah it, it needs to be the case. And it's another thing that we, we need to take advantage of the community. And we've tried to do that in Fedora it's somewhat, but we, we don't have the detailed test suite necessarily that we, we should have for it. And that you know, a lot of kernel is drivers. And whatever you're running on, you've only got a limited set of hardware there. So if we can get other people in the community testing whether it's our distro, somebody else's distro, or anything, that helps the kernel because we get a wider variety of hardware for the test. There's a talk about that tomorrow with Kevin Hillman, actually. So awesome. Yeah. And I, I just want to add to kind of what Tim was saying here is from a rel, from a rel perspective, one of our, our biggest concerns is our, our ecosystem of partners. They want to they want to submit changes to rel the kernel, but they don't have an easy way to to test rel, uh, hook into the, the build and testing system, so a lot of times they have to send it to us and, or they do the local testing. So having a framework like this where they can do that, you know, spreading out doing distro level testing from a partner perspective also helps it, I think, kind of mimic what you're saying from a rel thing. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's quite, quite a lot of things. Is anybody taking notes? <laughs> I can hear some, <laughs> can you hear some keyboard clicking things? <laughs> Um, so is it good from a distro point of view? Also, is it good from a kernel CI point of view? That might be a bit selfish, but uh, I think it helps the project because having, uh, you know, in the end, distro kernels are really used as opposed to upstream kernels and having something that um, it kind of closes the loop with real, and, uh, real um, use cases. And it's good for the project to have another more like down to earth dimension. And of course, if you have distro companies trying to join the project, then they might be interested also in running, uh, testing their kernel uh, in kernel CI. So we may have like a sub instance of kernel CI, for example, to not diverge because then if you open the door to distros, that's endless. You have, because distros are downstream trees in the end. So then where do you draw the line, which downstream trees you, in ac you accept or not? So I think it's about delimiting the problem spaces. You can have like the upstream kernel CI.org and maybe you can have like fedora.kernelci.org and debian.kernelci.org where you say these, you know, the set of builders and you define which labs are running things. So the same infrastructure, but you can tweak uh, how to make it work using the same tool in the middle. So the kernel CI tool will be the same. And if you wanted to do this at home, like I have kernel CI on my laptop, you can run it with, uh, with any kernel you want. So you can, like that person was saying a bit earlier, you can also do it in your own environment and reproduce exactly the same things, given if you given you have the same test platforms, of course, but at least should be enable, enabling you to do that. Uh, I think that's all I had. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I get the main points is that we're trying to get things directly upstream in a kernel are the best ways to do that, to, uh, to not have too much customization. But well, we are in we are, in fact, uh, running ahead of schedule right now. So, I mean, we're welcome to have uh, more time for discussion here if anyone wants to. I have a question. The kernel CI is just one of the kernel tests and systems and doesn't run lots of tests, doesn't use lots of debugging tools, doesn't report bugs. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose it? And are you considering also integration with six other kernel testing systems? Sorry, what's the end? Uh, wh why did you choose this one, and are you considering integrating with six other kernel testing systems? Okay, so it's because I'm working on kernel CI, and I found, <laughs> and I found it as uh, like an obvious thing to talk about, and I submitted this, and it was accepted. Now, of course, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> if other people doing other kernel upstream <laughs> tests want to discuss it, I think it's very, very important. Also, there's another uh, bit of a further discussion this afternoon. Um, about all the different types of upstream kernel test systems, and the idea is uh, to see how you know how much overlap there is between them, uh, how how we can consolidate that, so we, no, to avoid having everybody repeating the same things or everybody having an interesting feature. Can we pull all that together to have one thing that makes the best? Right. Basically, the idea is to same idea as open source, where everybody contributes to the same source code. The idea would be to have an open testing system where you, you know, everybody can contribute builders and platforms and, and tools and um, to make one solution for all the, all the different problems that people have. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but kernel CI is one example. It, I guess it's quite good because it tries to be generic, so it's not specific to one architecture. Like it's not made by Intel. It's not you know made by a distribution. It's not made by a phone manufacturer. It's not. It's it tries to be generic, so I guess it's a good candidate for that. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this question about uh, like having multiple CI systems running different things and basically trying to solve the same systems. Uh, we at CKI are running a hackfest on Thursday and Friday where we will discuss these things also with the kernel CI people and try to find some common solutions for the same problems that we are trying to all solve. So if every, anybody is interested in that, we still have a few free spots and you can join the discussions as well. Thursday and Friday. Um, how, is, how long does that usually take the uh, testing for the kind of CI over there? So in the average, so minutes or hours and uh, so on. It depends what you do. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, uh, it's yeah. CI, so it shouldn't take so long if you update regularly and yeah. testing there. And for example, in SUSE, we do um, test um, MM and file systems, and that takes days or up, up to a week mm -hmm. if you do the whole thing, testing, mm -hmm. so including me uh, performance measurement. Yeah, yeah. so uh, depending on the, on the tree that is being tested or the branch being tested, we are building more or less different dev configs. So some like maintainer trees or some individual distributor, tr uh, individual contributor trees, we're building like only three, five, ten kernels. And things like Linux, Max, Linux Next or Mainline or Stable, we're building the whole possible range, and now even with multiple compilers, and that's about 300 kernels. Of course, it takes longer, but if you have more builders, then it shortens it. So there's no definite answer about that. But right now, it can take a few hours, basically, between when a change is pushed on a Git branch like Mainline. It can take maybe, well, if, if the system is quiet, it will take maybe an hour or two. And if it's busy, it might take six or seven hours. And then the time to run boot tests and other tests, you might get the results only 12 hours later. But there are things that can be done to improve that. And we're working on it. And I think having like two hour feedback return time, uh, that should like round trip. That's the kind of thing we should be able to do. Which is still a bit too long to like be waiting for that before you can actually grow on. But at least it's but it's quick enough. So if something really went wrong, you'll catch it before the next day and be able to fix it. Okay. Um. Okay. If there's um, no uh, other questions, I'd like to propose we actually do a very short five-minute break so we can open the doors and try and get some ventilation in here. Um, it's very stuffy. I did ask about that, so we'll give uh, five minutes and to open the doors and then go to the next topic. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much.
my if I I think part of my presentation are already being discussed in the previous uh, preventive presentation discussion and my discussion is uh, I thought at first about a bit make gener gener generically discussion but I think I have a bit focus on Gen2, Gen2 distribution and so um, Gen2 distribution started to make uh, uh, automating system for checking his own uh, kernel package that is called a Gen2 kernel CI and <coughs> the motivation about doing is that uh, we are trying to make uh, at least giving a stable kernel to the user that uh, we try to don't, don't break the user system and to improve the quality on the package on the Gen2. And for doing that, um, so now I, I will give a little explanation about uh, the Gen2 kernel package, but I don't know if uh, how many Gen2 users there is. In Everyone use Gen2? Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so we have this package that is called a Gen2 source, that is the main uh, Gen2 kernel package. And from Gen2 source, we have other derived uh, Gen2 package, Gen2 kernel package that are like, uh, we have a CK source or Raspberry Pi source, but the kernel source are mainly everyone is taken from uh, Gen2 source. And Gen2 source is made by GenPatch and kernel source. GenPatch is a package that contains patch for each kernel. We have inside that only one specific Gen2 patch that is changing kconfig and is adding some uh, confi configuration uh, specific for Gen2 that are like uh, giving a Gen2 minimal building on some uh, Gen2 portage specific. Uh, configuration and then we have the a class that is uh, the tool that try to keep uh, toolchain compatibility we set extra version the blobbing doing all the distro work that uh, need to be done and applying uh, gen patches and then the user that is getting the gen2 source and it will configure the kernel however he want he will in some case add his own graphic uh, driver and <coughs> and do, do you make and make install and reboot the system and that <coughs> the gen2 kernel so uh, when we have to stabilize such package uh, we usually do uh, make or we have something we try to prepare something because uh, we we don't know which uh, configuration the user will be using we try to at, at first building with all the configuration and uh, if succeed we try to use uh, some reasonable can configuration for uh, for booting the booting the system and stabilize the package if everything is working and then we have the toolchain uh, we try to test also the toolchain that can introduce some uh, major change so for doing this at first, uh, we use a billboard and a simple script uh, with QEMU and Gen2 image and is uh, booting and just checking the boot that is working the boot of the script. And if it's working, is uh, succeeding and stabilizing the package. <coughs> what you were selecting for kernel configuration options. It's, it's, it's different for a distribution that you're actually testing different a set of kernel configuration options just because most distros usually have a single set. Yes. Um, how exactly, so uh, how often do you find bugs that upstream didn't catch, I guess, um, already or for with, with your set of configuration testing? Uh. Of course, we found uh, some bugs that are not upstream, and in such case, 
sometimes the user already know how to screen such bugs, so you will do by himself. Or uh, in other case, we have uh, our bug villa, and we will the user will send the the, the upstream the configuration bug to the bug villa. For caching is uh, like what if you do make all uh, uh, config and you see that he is compiling, but I, I think having checking all configuration is completely difficult. So wha one opi uh, one option is like trying to have a minimal configuration and try to work with that. And from that start to make more complicated configuration or try to check what configuration is most used, but also that you cannot be in too because you don't have like some statistic of which configuration is using which user. So in the end, you should have to test all configuration, but that is practically impossible. So how is this different from testing the mainline kernel, where again, you have some sort of different configuration? <coughs> the difference is that uh, we are, uh, we have the Gen2 toolchain that is, uh, and some configuration specific and some patch over uh, the kernel source that is uh, specific to Gen2. And for example, uh, this one is the specific kconfig uh, patch for Gen2, and then we have But uh, we have this uh, gen patch uh, that is uh, a container of patch. Sorry. So we have this uh, gen patch that is a container of patch that is sometimes not yet upstreamed to the largest next. So we try to check such patch. Uh, but the exact same principle can be applied, right? Because... Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And so could something like, say, uh, uh, syswap, no, not syswap, what's the Intel checker? That on which, you know, yes, if you really bought trying out, uh, you know, different frames, different configurations and so on, mm. could something like that help? What's that? Oh, uh, what's the name? A zero day bot. Intel has a zero day bot, and I mean, okay. essentially, what they try doing is picking up okay. packets from upstream okay. and test them out, and sometimes in different configurations as well. Okay. Yeah. I think it could be a possibility to use such things. And uh, well, like I, I don't think the infrastructure is the the code for the infrastructure is publicly available, but okay. Maybe now we're starting to see places where this functionality would be useful. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so it sounds like the proposal. It sounds like the su suggestion is, is is that can we possibly take some of what the testing has been doing for Gen two and say put it into other CI testing systems for things that either CKI zero day or or anything like that. Just because it, it does seem to be very very useful. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Recently, uh, we heard about kernel CI, and we decided to change uh, from our QEMO script and use uh, Lava, and this is practically the same Lava that is used in kernel CI, on that is working on Docker for <coughs> testing package. And but. We are trying to keep the custom customizability of Buildbot for uh, wha what we need for testing each uh, kernel package. So, <coughs> for uh, generalizing, uh, <coughs> like w which uh, tools, which distribution are using, or uh, like I, I don't know 
uh, what other distribution, uh, which tool are using for tracking its own kernel, and I don't know if such thing is applicable to Jenkins. So, So Red Hat actually went through some of this with internal stuff about trying to figure out what we wanted to start as for building kernels. Like we started out using, I believe, Jenkins 76 for this, and that, so I was curious if you wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the experiences with why Red Hat picked this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, in regards, we start. Yeah, I think we can just jump in. Yeah, we start out. Yeah. So we have a CKI project. It's kernel CI. Um, we start out with Jenkins, and then. Uh, we got Groovy Dude just came some became too much of a problem. Uh, we spend more time hacking on Groovy, so we moved away, we moved into GitLab, and we've been uh, a happy customer since. It's been a nice experience. Um, we never tried BuildBot. Uh, I know Fedori uses it, but uh, we just GitLab seemed like a better solution for us. So Jenkins just didn't work out. Just in the there's a lot of a lot of infrastructure at Red Hat that does mm -hmm. use Jenkins, mm -hmm. but um, our particular use case just we spent more time on Jenkins and less on Jenkins. Okay. Yes, we, we also at the past tried to use uh, Kernel CI Jenkins, but we found that uh, it didn't work also for us. Like uh, Kernel CI is using pipe pipeline for uh, uh, making its configuration change for each kernel package and for doing some other stuff. <laughs> and but we 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 found more. Uh, uh configurability, configurability. Co it was more uh, simple to configure everything by BuildBot. And, and then we, we thought, uh, we talked about also like what we want to test for each package. Like I think, uh, for example, KSF test is a good way for checking like that uh, most of the things in the kernel are actually working, so it's also good for us for having some uh, feedback for knowing if we are broken or something in the user system. So we, we are thinking to implement KSF test as checking for uh, our automated system. But if, if there are any other uh, any other testing that are not like just boot test for the kernel? Like I, uh, at least I know these three. But I just like to uh, also test that even though it's a KSF test, but it's actually fairly generic these days. Okay. Uh, you have the MM uh, test suite I mean, I I'm trying to do a job, so I'm not comparing a MM test, but there are a bunch of these already done. And w w wha what is actually checking that? MM is for the memory management okay. subsystem, XFS. You know, it's mainly for XFS, but there's also testing out the generic DFS stuff. Okay. Uh, then you have the XT4 um, test. There, there are a bunch of these uh -huh. out there. Can I, pig can I piggyback that question? Uh, not to go down a rat hole, but is there any other distributions or people out here who have trouble finding out what tests to run for their distribution or uh, based on the, the changes in the kernel? I know from the CKI perspective, uh, and as you just alluded to, uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out XFS tests or MM tests or LTP and some of their test suites. Uh, one of the things you know, I'd like to coordinate with is trying to figure out how to com you know, communicate or collaborate what test suites people are running in, in, a, in, yes. a, in a, a, a common area so they can Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I think this kind of ties in what you were saying, is you don't know, and a lot of us don't know. It's kind of word of mouth. You have to be plugged in. Yeah. So for, the, for the bot session, um, we are certainly accepting bots. I'm also ha happy to use um, you know, s some of this uh, time here if we have any extra time as well. So my... My issue is not so much knowing what tests ought to be run, but uh, for, 
that this all really uh, pull the Fed up to be able to, uh, you know, sit running CI is a huge amount of work, um, and so it's um, signing time and and get signing all the instructions to be able to to run these things and have them be more or less reliable so that it's not uh, actually that they're actually kept regressions rather than CI problems or or token problems. Uh, I seem to remember someone uh, blogged about um, having um, uh, the the um, um, having done the co uh, configuration management uh, for uh, setting up uh, to run a bunch of tests, but I <laughs> can't remember who mm. that was. Maybe someone else saw that. It might have been on Kernel Planet. I think it was on Kernel Planet. Uh, I, I think probably it would be nice to have some documentation. Like, I think one of the good things that Kernel CI is doing is writing a bunch of documentation, and some of that can can be useful for also for other distribution, I think. So having like a documentation with which tools they are using and uh, yeah, so, so something more, something that you think they're missing. So, so the bigger challenge I've seen with the Fed is not that they don't exist, that sometimes they break um, or sometimes they haven't worked for a very long time and we don't know whether okay. it's a bug or whether the test is just broken. Okay. Um, y you cannot keep in such, <laughs> if no, you have not built a batch of such thing, but. I mean, LTP is an example. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I rest my case. <laughs> yes. That's definitely a mistake not to keep it. <laughs> okay, in the spirit of plumbers, if we all are having the same problem, let's think about some next steps then, is, is that if we're not sure what to do about is the test broken or the kernel broken. Um, so can I make a comment just on, on that spot? So one of the things I've been looking at at Fuego, and I know very few people have heard of Fuego, that's one of my own advertising problems, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things I've been thinking about Fuego is we need to actually test the test. And there is a very difficult problem, which is how do you determine the difference between a test failure or a lab failure or a actual regression in the software and the test. Um, and so, and one of the things that I'm very keen on is figuring out a way that we can share, and I've used this example a million times, so pardon me if you've already heard it, but LTP produces a whole bunch of failures that you know are just garbage, and it'd be nice to be able to come up with some way to share that information so that other people can know it's garbage and know to ignore it. And so I don't know if that's, uh, we have something in Fuego called the pass criteria, which okay. basically says, you know, you can ignore this. But it, we have to come up with like a shareable format and a place to share things, and there's a whole bunch of issues involved if we're gonna make progress on that, I think. So. Yeah, I, I, I am gonna counter, because I know we like to pick on LTP a lot, but it, but it turns out it does in fact find things, and perhaps like oh. say the, the, the namespace is such that now, what, what do we do, uh, do about backspace? How can we make it easier to differentiate between things that are failing because it has well, that? Right, yeah, that's why I think it's important. I think LTP is actually a really useful tool, yeah. but the noise interferes with its, its utility, so. Th there is some documentation about that on Fuego. Like, w there is some documentation about uh, LTP test on Fuego. Uh, no. <laughs> 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 I mean, so we have, we have documented our past criteria file. Okay. Uh, we have not proposed it as an industry standard. I think it's premature, and we're like in the process of talking about this stuff. So we're talking about some of the test definition stuff. We're going to be talking at CKI later this week, and then at Automated Testing Summit in Lyon. Uh, and I think past criteria is one of the things. Test dependencies is one of the things that we want to talk about um, at some of these other events. And we could talk about them here if there's a boss, but I don't, I don't want to hijack uh, what people are doing here with that. So one thing I have to add is that um, in Lenara we have a project called Test Definitions, which is used to wrap a lot of different tests. And a lot of projects have this concept where they have a project that wraps all the other projects they want to run, all the test suites they want to run. Um, and, it, and we 
Lego has the same thing, I think. And uh, we use that to standardize like the inputs and the outputs of each test suite so that you can parse them all um, the same. And we also maintain skip files in there which represent um, the issues we've found in FTP specifically, but for um, secure test nets as well. And that's on GitHub. Where can I find that? It's under Linaro slash test dash definition. So, so I guess uh, the quest for uh, you know you and Tim and everybody else who's doing something like this, which probably includes us, is we probably need to standardize this and put it in one common place instead of 10, maybe 15, 15 different parts. Ultimately, we could possibly take effort to fix those tests which are known to be broken. So I What we've noticed in the CTI team is it fails once every 100 times. It's hard to debug, and, and they, it, it's all race conditions, and, and a lot of the maintainers, like XFS tests, are like, we've known this for years, it's just hard to reproduce and fix. So we are talking about LC, uh, LCP, but uh, LCP, but how many are using live session tests on CTI? Three. Mostly is using tested tests, I would think. And uh, Red Hat is not using tested tests for uh, checking the kernel? I don't think we also have that service for uh, checking if, I don't know if that's a CTI or not, but it's a thing in the way that still, it, we haven't quite figured out how to get that CMR stuff to work in the design of it. Uh, I, I also use te CTI tests to self-test for my own developer base, so it's kind of that much code that I can test on. And and then a second topic is like Lava or Fuego or some uh, CNCI developer made uh, DDCI that is a specific uh, is just for booting and is made on Python. And so there is or Lava or Fuego or someone that is making his own script for like we made for Gentoo SCI that we made our script for starting a QM when the testing, or I don't know if there is any other uh, similar tool that are. Uh, actually, I, 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 I didn't test Fuego, so I don't know how it's different from. Um, so, okay, I don't know if your question is specific about K self tester, but. So Fuego has a bunch of notions that are kind of in prototype form, but not really uh, pushable to as like industry standard. Um, and so one of the reasons we have these discussions is we don't want to develop a bunch of stuff that like no one else is going to use or care about. Um, in terms of testing, I mean we're uh, we've got a wrapper for K self test, uh, but I think we have the same uh, problem that other people have, which is that there's a lot of uh, I don't know how to put it, ad hocery in K self test. Uh, and even though uh, they've standardized on KTAP or, or TAP 13, or a version of TAP 13 with some uh, K self test extensions, uh, that that's not true of all of the tests in there. And so mm -hmm. there's really a problem putting that into an automated CI loop because you can't count on the format being the same for all of the subtests that are in there. It's becoming better, <laughs> because. Yeah, it's getting better. And, the, and, and it could just be fixed. It, it, it's something that's not producing the right output format. Yeah, so I, I think the last topic that is more specific to meta distribution, I don't know how many, uh, like Yocto or Gen2, is like, uh, and what uh, Laura Habot said uh, about uh, configuration that are different from each user how to test in such case. So my opinion was like, that probably you cannot test each, each configuration of each user because we don't know. So we try to do similar tests as upstream. So trying to do a case of test LPT. And then, 
and having some configuration that are similar. Uh, some so this is probably a question I should already know the answer to, but how far off is the Gen2 kernel from the latest upstream? Are you fairly uh, uh, <coughs> close to it? or we are, we are fairly close. And how often, I mean, how enthusiastic are your users about upgrading the kernel? Uh, they are usually, most of users are getting latest uh, kernel version. Right, because, because at that point in time, it might actually, you know, supports not just testing what they're doing, supports also fixing yes, bugs yes, they yes. report, right? And maybe at that point in time, it maybe might make more sense to work closer with upstream. Because at this point yes, in time, yes. this just feels closer to what upstream does. Yes, actually, we have already some users that are developing upstream and some users that are more doing Gen2 distro stuff. So uh, I think that is one of the way. And we also have like, we have latest kernel and then we are trying to follow a stable kernel version. And so usually stable kernel version is stabilized and latest version is testing. So wh when you say stable, you mean uh, a non-RC kernel or is it long-term stable? Is uh, what stable is in kernel CI, in kernel .org. So, okay. so I guess what I'm the point I want to make is if it's a config option that only a specific user wants to use, and if it's fairly close to upstream, uh, more often than not, the developers are fairly willing to work on helping yes, you yes. test it or, or so on. So maybe that's yes, where that's that what goes. we are doing about such problem. Usually, uh, actually, we have only one patch that is different from, uh, that is completely different from upstream and that is the one that is specific to Gen2. And other patch are, we al always try to upstream or. Uh, so you were asking what uh, Yocto does. So Yocto has some kind of static configuration. So it has all these QMU based systems and it does a regression and it okay. compares it to pre-existing um, set up so that you can track changes almost real time as, as we do a build daily. So you can, that's how you can track the regressions in Yocto. So, so you have a stable configuration and then you update that. Yeah, so for example, um, like the ARM, like QMU ARM setup, yeah. we have it configured a certain way. And um, so we know already based on the initial setup by okay. the developer, what passes and what fails. Hope in a perfect world, nothing would ever fail, but obviously there'll be some open bugs for it or whatever. And so we know what's go supposed to pass and we can track it. If something fails, then we know that a new kernel thing has changed or something like that. We, c we can open a new bug and address that or maybe it's trivial and can be addressed okay. you know, quickly. Yeah, but I think it's an uh, interesting solution and uh, also Gen2 have like a minimal configuration and we could start from there and then going on with adding configuration option. But so um, Yocto does this for every, everything QMU supports. So like MIPS, I, mean yes. I don't know, I don't know if RISC-V is mm -hmm. a thing yet, but ARM, ARM64, x86, like shotgunning. Okay. We've got about five minutes left in this slot, so we can have more discussions or take a short break. Um, if there's any other, do you have any more content you want to present or? Uh, no, I'm okay. I'm proud of you for discussion. <laughs> We've got five okay. minutes, Tim. Okay, so sorry, this is unrelated to your talk, but it's a talk earlier in the day, uh, and it was about the uh, comparing, doing the diff on the ABI stuff, right? So it occurred to me that it'd be really nice if that was done like for every patch that went into LTS, just validated that the ABI was not changed. Um, but it, it, I want to take it up a level from that specific thing. Included in that was this notion that you're going to diff a base uh, uh, set XML with the new XML. And one of the issues I found in Fuego is that uh, that comes up a lot, where essentially you have the expected values that you want to obtain in an automated fashion. You want to get your expected values 
by doing some kind of snapshot of the system, and then later, after you've applied patches or changed the configuration or whatever, you want to make sure that none of those expected values have changed. And as a generic problem, I also see that as an issue, that uh, it'd be nice if we could share somehow those sets of expected values uh, as an industry, right? So if LTS has a certain uh, base ABI, uh, it may seem trivial, like, oh, well, everybody can go run that. Uh, and get the, you know, the ABI base XML file, but it, you shouldn't have to, right? There should, it should be a known entity that's distributed throughout the entire industry. What is the base ABI for, uh, for that particular kernel? Yeah, you're and the under same the assumption that LTS has a guaranteed stable ABI, and it absolutely does not. Well, right. It, wasn't that the whole point of the presentation though, that it should? No, the, the point was they're doing this and that's what they want to do, but L, the LTS kernels won't have any more of a stable ABI guarantee than anything else does. Okay, I, I like this yeah. discussion, but I want to make sure that we do get a little bit of time between the setup. So, okay. um, I, I love the idea that instead of anyone pitching to you, they're spun together ABI people, throw them off. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's, uh, my, my point was not so much about stable ABI as it is the notion that you have base mm -hmm sets of expected values mm -hmm. that we're not sharing as an industry, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, thank you. I uh, just like to say the thing that I was trying to remember what it was earlier on was called K dev. I have one in my bag. Let me okay. um, mm. No, no, the, uh, Do you hold I get the mic? everything. Yeah, do you, do you hold I get the everything. Yeah. Hold, the, hold, hold the mic. I'm no, I don't, but I can uh, just pay it to you. Hold on. Oh, you're awesome. Thank you. So, hi. Uh, while they're getting set up, I just want to say this is our last topic. Uh, thank you very much for coming and participating. This is the first time I've tried to run the distributions microconference as well. Um, if you have any feedback or things you'd like to see, or if you have, or if you think we should try and run this next year, if you think we shouldn't try and run this next year, I'd love to he hear it. Or you can pass it on to any other other of the committee members, and then they can come and you know give their feedback to me. So, just thought I'd pass it on. Um, the way the BOFs work is, is that you can go to uh, any of the um, online and for registration and you can sign up there and they'll be scheduled ad hoc. I think there are a few more that have been come in. Um, check on the schedule and find me after lunch and I'll double check with the other committee members. You can also ask at the registration desk. I think they'd probably be able to find stuff as well. But we'll You got something up there. Oh, there it's gone.
Can we just use your laptop? Yes, let's just use your, your laptop. Okay, part of the hardest part of running a conference is getting used to them. I, I debated doing that. Um, I thought I would give this a shot, but I think next time, but good luck in life. Okay, sorry about the equipment problems. My name is uh, George Kennedy. I'm uh, going to talk about uh, distros and syscaller. This is my first LPC, as you could probably tell. Um, first off, I'm not a fuzzing expert. Um, I've been uh, looking at Syscaller for a while, probably less than a year, to try to uncover bugs in mainly our code and the stable tree merges that we pull to build our distro release. Um, I wanted to tell you what we're doing, the problems that we're having, and hopefully you can tell me what I'm doing wrong and, and uh, we can fix the problems. Okay, so uh, what? Find out how distros and others are using Syscaller and other fuzzers. Um, is anybody using Syscaller in their distros? You must work for Google, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, well, we want to try to make it part of our distribution uh, release process. Uh, I started using this for Chrome OS and Android. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. So what are, are you using it for? Because, because I got the impression that you were using it mainly for upstream last year and not as much for the internal Google kernel. We use it for upstream. That's one of the main targets. But we also use it for Chrome OS, Android, some of the internal kernels. Also some other operating systems as well. OK. Also LTS releases. And, and, and do you know if any of your vendors use it? I don't know. No, I don't know. Okay, so um, well, why we're, we're hoping that we can come up with a common framework, but you know, there's just one of us here that cares, uh, and uh, how through common integration. All right, so um, this is, um, right now we're prototyping with Syscaller, and uh, we're using, um, uh, we, our, our kernel uh, tracks v4.14. So we are, we can't use the latest compilers. We're using uh, 4.85 on our Jenkins. Uh, so we're moving along, um, trying to upgrade. Uh, these might be some of the reasons why we stop our continuous syscaller runs, but maybe also, uh, you know, new version of syscaller comes along. Um, and this is where we want to be, th this is where we are today. So we have to build the kernels on our own servers because of the compiler issues, and uh, we'll stop uh, syscaller with new, uh, new releases and things like that. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, we have a uh, auto bug create tool cron job running, looking for new crashes. We have a bug database. Uh, it's primed with existing bugs to try to avoid uh, dupes. Um, when uh, new crashes come along, we check the database and we really are focusing on bugs in our code and the uh, stable tree merges that we pull in. Uh, we want to see what we're inheriting with the stable tree merges. Go ahead. Actually, now that since we have, we have you here, 
Uh, how different is this from what SysBot does? How often are you re are you restarting SysCaller when you? I mean, I don't know. Can you? Yes, yeah, so this is very similar to what SysBot does. Okay, good. Solve the same thing. So it does continuous build. It, it has some now like latency when it does the rebuilds. It's something like day for it, it updates both the syscaller source and the kernel source. It builds the image and it has the integration with the bug tracking tool. So it actually okay. creates the. Okay. Uh, um, what's the specific integration that you have? So for the bug tracking, yes. so we have, so it has kind of abstract interface with, that you can extend. It currently has an interface with mailing list that is used for upstream and some other kernels. And we also have one other president, president integrating it with bug, Bugonizer, which is our internal bug tracking system. But the interface is pretty generic and there were requests to extend it to say Bugzilla and some other Jira. Uh, it basically like create a bug, post a comment, pull, pull status updates, and so on. So how often do you start all the servers, restart them all at the same time? Do you stagger, or you must have a big farm, a big server farm? It went it's medium-sized farm. Okay, they, they I mean, do you stop at? Only, only 10,000 servers. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, no comment, yeah. kernels, we use like five machines. Oh, okay. Um, they are started at different times as okay. the kernels, as the new commits to the kernels are pushed. So do you, do you have a mix of uh, vendors like uh, AMD or? No, no it's mo most of it is done on GC. All of the all of this is okay. currently runs on GC. Syscall yeah. itself supports running on Coemo and actual physical hardware and so on, but yeah. we don't do because it's harder. Okay. Yeah, we have planned to use Coemo because it can emulate more of a hardware and we can actually cover more of the uh, subsystems. Okay. But then you just test the emulated hardware in QMU, which I found is uh, parts of it are very Lacking. not good. Yeah. I think you did some QMU tests, right? Uh, yes, we can get to that. Because uh, um, we're on AMD, we're testing a, you know, AMD and Intel. Mm -hmm. So I can get to that. So this is where we are today. And we're now going to. Uh, Prototype would be uh, 5.2, so we're hoping to move to the future. Oops, keep going the wrong way. So we can now do Jenkins builds with uh, the latest GCC A compiler. <coughs> we can build uh, syscaller capable kernel RPMs, and when a Jenkins build comes along, we halt syscaller, uh, install the RPM to the VM, and then restart the the uh, syscaller with the VZ image and it RMFS from the VM. So this is where we want to be. And um, it sounds like this looks like SysBot. Yes. Yeah. So for syscaller, there are certain things you have to do um, build-wise, like you have to build a custom kernel. You can consume a generic distro kernel and run syscaller on it. Well, we have to uh, set the config the syscaller configs uh, KCOB and KSON and okay. you, want, uh, you so don't want any modules, kernel, you want them all. Uh, some kernel options is yeah. the config yeah. options. Yeah. Okay. But that's all you have to change, right? Uh, debug FS. Uh. So it, it can actually run on any kernel, it just becomes less efficient. For example, if you don't have code coverage, it will be just find less bugs. If you don't have KSN, you will hit bugs, but you will not actually understand that you hit bugs. And we have a script which may be useful for you and may, which may need some improvement, um, which accepts a, your config kind of baseline and it tries to produce config suitable for SysBot with all of the case and KCOP, you know, disable randomization, disable tracing, enable. So you have a whole bunch of uh, built in config files. Is that what you're talking about? Um, in the tree, the syscaller tree? No, not the complete config. We also have a script which you can give your config and okay. it will like turn off all of the necessary configs, they're actually much more than them, and then disable some like, that are harmful and so on. Okay. We're gonna give you the Is that in config. the tree or is that Yes, it should be in the oh, tree. Oh, what's the name of that then? Oh. Just out of curiosity, the name of the script? Yeah. I'll look it up. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you prime the database with, with crashes? I guess you're priming it with upstream crashes? 
Uh, well, that's the next question. We, these, I'm priming it with our own bugs, so we've hit quite a few bugs in our code. Um, and so we don't want to see those again. That's really what we're looking at. But I do, the missing link is uh, how we separate out the upstream bugs. Okay, so you don't, right now you don't have a way to automatically correlate a crash that you see in your kernel. We don't want to see the... A crash that's, that's already known upstream. Well, right. You, that's missing. You, you do want to hit the, get a bug created for the crash that you have hit upstream because that's got to be fixed in your kernel. Sure. Uh, but I think the, the bit that he's trying to focus on is, hey, this one has a known fix upstream. Yeah. yeah. And so we can bring that back versus, hey, is this a brand new bug? Or just being able to see that no, hey, someone's it, working on this upstream. Right. Well, the other thing yeah. is we, you know, we branch off on, we do an update and we branch off on a stable, uh, at a stable tree level, yeah. And then we want to know what bugs are inheriting at, at that point. Gotcha. And we might have to cherry pick fixes, things like that from upstream. There's also all the report ID tracking that goes through upstream that you want to be tied to your, yes. your database as well. I right. mean, patches that are fixes for syscall reported bugs yep. identify which one and, and all of those things. Right. Yes, I, mean, I don't know if you know this, I don't know if you know this, but SysBot has a, a reference attached to it every time so that they can correlate it to the uh, a fix for a bug they reported. Okay. So maybe we, yeah, it might be useful to track that. Right. I mean, I look through the website and I, you know, if that's it that I'm looking at, if there's a script that, you know, helps you out with that, that'd be great. Is there a way how do you, if you have a script to correlate a bug fix to the SysBot uh, uh, reported bug? Yes, we, yes. Okay, so. There is a reference between box and fixes. Okay, all right. Uh, so here's um, my chance to shout out, uh, uh, give a shout out to Syscaller and uh, how it helped our distro release. Um, Syscaller found this uh, case on stack out of bounds bug in RDS way back when. The commit to fix it went upstream way back when. It also went in our distro release, uh, but weekly syscaller runs showed that the bug came, uh, showed back up again. And I got yelled at by the PM, hey, the commit is in there, what's wrong with your test? And it turned out we actually had overlaid the fix with, uh, with new code. So syscaller found the regression, and um, that was, I don't know, it was a good thing. Um, So, how do others track syscaller? And this is probably up for you. And we, st we pull stable tree uh, merges to build our distro release, and uh, syscaller tracks latest upstream, but I'm wondering also, do you track the stable tree? Because um, we, we run into these types of errors as a result. The uh, repro C program will fail because the host we're testing on is like missing defines, things like that. Um, so I was wondering in that case, if maybe Syscall, when it starts, could build maybe a fake repro C program just so we know that we're missing. So this is all part of Sysbot. Ah, when okay. Sysbot picks up a new Syscall or builds, it actually runs tests for the Syscall or to check that okay. it's a good build. And okay. the same happens with the kernel. When it pulls a new kernel, builds it, runs some basic tests before it kind of accepts it for testing. Okay. To avoid this situation, then it kind of all right pick up new code which is broken and then it's all broken. Yeah, because uh, I've run into this before and hours later you see that the repro C program hasn't, uh, hasn't been built. And, uh, yeah, okay, and good. we have tests for all of this as well. Okay, excellent. Uh, the other one, because we're, we're following the stable tree, one of the uh, branches or we branch off, syscall will build itself, will, syscall will fail because we're missing a kernel defined. And so, uh, you know, we're not at the, we're not building out the, on the upstream. Are you building it on Windows? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm running the show on Windows. No, I'm not. We, on, yes. We actually could support hey. Windows as a host. It should actually be easy. Yeah. But, uh, all right. Yes. Uh, we, we have to kind of uh, get bisect the repro to find the one that works with our because we're not building it on the latest upstream. We're not building syscall on the latest upstream kernel. We might be building it on one of our updates. 
So, you know what I'm saying? I know. So we, we have a CI. We have some brief breakages sometimes, but generally we try to keep it working. Okay. At least on Linux. Yeah. The CI is on Linux, so the Darwin build may break and Windows build may uh, break. We're not on Windows, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways. So I have a, how, how often are you actually finding sys bugs that you're hitting with sysbot such that sys, syscaller will stop? Uh, that's pretty, pretty rare. So, but it's one of the things we're running. It's a, it's a tough one to track down if the repo C program. Oh, okay. Well, let me clarify that. I'm not sure if it came out the right way. Yeah. How often are you actually find? How often is syscaller itself finding bugs in your kernel? Uh, well, we know it finds it in some areas. Our modules, we know it's going to find bugs. I mean, m m mostly I think my question I was, I was trying to get at was is that you mentioned you're continuously pulling in new kernels, but I'm thinking that if we wanted to try apply this for other distributions this, and say if you're focused on something on a stable kernel base, that's getting stable kernel updates possibly as soon as every three days. Is yeah. that enough time to even do meaningful fuzzing on uh, a kernel in, in a time period of three days? Okay. So we are not getting stable updates into the distro every three days because, well, at that point in time, it's hard to get the testing and so on done. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we might be two weeks behind or something. Yeah, two, maybe three weeks behind. And, yeah. and so, and we get a bunch of them in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's the point in time, I, I guess, syscaller would be very useful. I do know that, you know, before George did this, we, we tried to run stuff for another part of the kernel. And we got a, a fairly high number of issues. Uh, of course, they were also already fixed upstream in newer versions of the kernel. Um, so, right. If we if we go on an update, uh, we're going to probably cherry pick those fixes to fix uh, stuff in our updates. Uh. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, for the stable kernels, what we more important is rather verification of the fixes. So, if we get so, just that it means that applying the um, test cases from the sys caller, and if that works, then it's fine, basically. So we, not, we don't have to um, yeah, <coughs> find the new bugs from the stable tree. Yeah, not necessarily. That's an, okay, so, so it sounds like your, your suggestion is, is that it's less of the finding new bugs but verifying the old ones then. That's true. <laughs> well, I mean, finding regressions, you want to. Yeah, right. Is it possible to just run the reproducers and not that's run That's where I'm getting, okay, now we're, that's like my next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, one of these slides up here. I was that's, transitioning back I'm gonna, to That's go. my wish list, that's coming up. Yeah, so that's, that's part with that, that bug ID being in there, that, that ID is also in the patches and you can grep this color in the list of stable patches for any given thing and see what's supposed to be fixed. Okay. I, I guess the question is, how many of these have been fixed in a version newer than that stable, but have not made it back to stable yet? Oh, it frequently, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Frequently, I got like six CVs uh, filed yesterday or today, and of those, three of those were already in stable kernels, and three of those are still not in stable yet. So they, there's a process. It, they're fixed, they're put in, the, in an upstream subtree, that tree eventually gets in the Linus's tree, and then it can be run to stable, um, and that happens fairly quickly, but yeah, there's a lot of them. Does anybody verify those? <laughs> <laughs> is, anybody, is anybody verifying that those um, patches that make it back into stable are actually um, not reproducible anymore? Ideally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We already had one head injury. <laughs> yeah, I mean, from from a CV standpoint, so I'm not tracking every syscaller bug upstream, but when we get CVs filed, yes, those CVs are usually filed with the reproducer, and the reproducer, well, yeah. But is anybody doing it? Yes. Yes. yes there are people doing it. Um, so, I mean, I, I just wanted to add to what you said. I mean, you pointed out three fixes already upstream. Sorry, three fixes already in stable, and then three fixes upstream. Uh, and at that point in time, the value comes out to run syscaller because we know there are fixes that are not in stable yet or maybe even not known by stable. Oh, they're, they're not actually <coughs> even in upstream yet. So <laughs> uh, the, the way Sasha's got his bot doing things that 
essentially syscaller fixes and things like that, once they hit Linus's tree, they tend to make the next stable. But there's a lot of things that haven't hit Linus's tree yet. Right. So I was toying with the stable next idea for stuff like that, to, to at least get it, no, testing going on stuff that still didn't make it to stable, but just they're about to and we should get started. Um, it's more of a time constraint at this point, but if, if you think it's useful, I can spend some more time on that. That sounds actually very useful and I'll be happy to help. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, Let us know how we can help. Yeah. If you're interested, so we have all of this in the database. So we have a database with several thousands of very interesting programs. That's okay. That can be extracted. These we, are reproduce the C programs. Cool. Yeah, we, we don't have exact story for yeah. this, and potentially we can generate even. So you don't need the uh, you don't need the syscaller framework. You could just run. Yes. This. Yeah. This could be Beautiful. just a set of. 5,000 C programs. Okay, you're stealing all We don't have full story for how exactly to extract and update all of this, but yeah, that, that's should okay. Be that's fun. a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's uh, and, and I guess these database, this database has the the sysbot ID for that reproducer, which then can hopefully be used to find the commit that fixed it. Yes, yes, they can be linked to patches. Okay. In, in some cases, they can be linked to patches that fix them. Okay. Okay, so there's nobody here that probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because so nobody's using syscaller, right? Except for. But right here. the database that you said could be somehow public, made public. It is. If depends. I think you said it is. Yeah. Uh, it ah, is. it is already, right? Yeah, the, yeah. That, the bug database you're talking about is public, right? So yes. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 So this is my wish list, and here it comes. Uh, you're saying this shouldn't happen, but maybe we can talk. I could maybe give you an example. So syscaller failing because we're building it on a uh, update versus uh, the latest upstream. You know, we're missing a defined. Uh, ah, okay. If you mean that the syscaller build itself fails, that's sorry, that's a fundamental Linux problem. Okay. You just can yeah, reliably well, build an NZC program. <laughs> yeah. On well, we're it's this college using a latest kernel defined that we don't have. Or yeah, because we try to f test some of the latest Linux things, so we need some defined. Actually, in a number of cases, we had to open code some of the structures yep. because it's just not possible to you know have a set of includes that will one, work on any one distribution. Fits all, one size fits all kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, we we can so f spot fix some of them by also. Providing defines in the syscaller rather than including some headers. Okay, but and then this one's already been mentioned. It sounds like it's out there. This would be great for us. The um, the database of the repro C programs. That would be a, a great help. So it's it's not there, but it's possible to create it. In okay, case. because we need to know the exact form and. and how right, there's exactly a wealth of knowledge works. there that would be great. To, it would probably cut out a lot of testing, regression testing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess there's not a lot of fuzzing going on here. I oh, I, can I make a few comments? So yeah. one thing, so if your goal is to find bugs yeah. and then step to fix bugs, then you can jump right to step two because we're testing the stable and there is at least four hundred of bugs in 4.14 that are known and that are not fixed. Right. So uh, we, we really focused so on our modules. Um, you know, okay. we, we want to know what we're inheriting too with the stable. We're going to branch off on a stable. You okay. Know. So, I, so, so hold on. Let me have a comment about that. So it's, it's, it's not just, you know, 414 bugs. Uh, since it's a, it's a distro kernel, an enterprise kernel, we bring back other features uh, from newer versions of the kernel. We also have code that we are carrying that we are working on upstreaming, uh, but we also want to ship it. Um, so there are different things as well, which is where you know it starts becoming useful. Now, knowing that there is a bug database already that we can use to prime ours means we can then avoid these duplicates and say, hey, we already know about these. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, that's what I want to talk next. So the Sysbot, Sysbot does all of what we seem to be doing. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, the Sysbot application itself is not, it's kind of a stable product. So we sometimes change, for example, database format, and then we do manual 
update of the database, so it's not that There's intervention that has to go along with it's using SysBot, is what you're it's saying. It's open source, but we, yeah, we don't ready to commit that it's all super stable. Yeah. But we potentially, we could run SysBot on your repo. And yeah. we mainly need two things for this. One is a Git repo, and the second is your config. Right, so we have uh, a GitHub. It's probably two weeks behind. Yeah, also the important thing is desire to fix the <laughs> bugs that it will find. Actually, that's what I, because that was one <laughs> of the other questions. Who <laughs> fixes the bugs? Is it just out there for anybody to fix? or So you've got hundreds of well, bugs. Well, the, the upstream uh, mail to upstream mailing lists, and we try to find the, the maintainers. Yep. For LTS, nothing happens. So we okay. published them, but we didn't figure yeah, out what actually should happen. Okay, so we might be interested <laughs> in fixing so some of them. There, there are these LTS bugs that were sent just to the maintainers and LTML, or it, it just goes currently to public mailing list that nobody's subscribed to. <laughs> so there may be some people, but. That my boss is yelling at me, why aren't you getting mail? Can, can you maybe <laughs> just to see the stable mailing list on those two? Are you so we'll that? Well, okay, you, you gave me permission, so yes, we sure we'll do go this. For it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's there for. Yeah. But so. Um, well, so I was going to, backing up to your, your question about the reproducers, I don't know enough about fuzzing, this is probably just going to be a dumb question, but uh, it seems like uh, that, that's a problem, the, the idea of sharing tests that uh, is kind of a bigger industry problem, right? So it'd be nice if there was a server somewhere uh, that you could go and grab tests off of and just run them, and then when you found, like when the, the syscaller or some other test found fuzzer found something that that was or you know caused a problem you want to run that again in an aggression context later uh, it'd be nice if there was an industry-wide repository of those things possibly in source form or possibly in the source form is syscaller itself right the github project but in it'd be nice if they were in binary format <coughs> sitting somewhere so you could just grab like the tarball but I don't but the problem's bigger than just syscaller we have the same problem with with other types of tests where you want to have the binary just readily available to, to run. And so part of that is the test definition stuff that we've been talking about and we're planning to talk about at the CKI Hackfest um, to make it so that you can just have a central repository, you can grab a test off of, run it, and, and get your results. So I got one more for you. I, I know I've communicated with you on, uh, I'm running out of time. The uh, very last one, so you only have uh, Chrome. I mean, it'd be great if you could get more architectures in your, your server farm. Because for instance, this last one, um, I think you and I talked about, we're only seeing this on the AMD servers. And it looks like it's happening in KVM, in, uh, in SVM. Currently our farm is GC. Yeah, yeah. It'd be great if you could <laughs> expand it with one more type of. <laughs> Here's <laughs> Here's the link. If anybody wants to fix it, there's a link. Uh, here's the question. How hard it would, would it be to run SysBot outside of Google? Let's say you, the source open and I pick it up. How hard would it be for me to run it? So you mean, so there are two options. You can run the whole thing, just grab the sources and do your own deployment. Yep. As I said, we do not support fully. It is a stable thing. Second option is to kind of have a, what I think kernel CI does, have a kind of farm of machine that is running, but then it connects to the centralized SysBot instance for reporting purposes and so on. So that's something what, that was in the plans, and Syscaller itself perfectly supports this, but we never actually did it. It, it should be possible. Okay. Yes, we can discuss this. Okay. All right, here's my... I know who to talk to. A few yeah. things I wanted, we have, we have minus one minute, is that if you actually run on SysBot, then it will provide also cross-references. For example, this back happens in your distro, but also on the stable tree, okay. which may be very useful. Yes. Yeah. And also, one thing that is, would be useful for contribution is extending the subsystems that this color covers, because we still cover about 7% of the kernel. Right. So if there are systems that are interested, then... Well, that's what I, I would probably need help with that. How do I, you know, build my, my VM to include more subsystems and have syscaller test them? Yeah, so we have, we have... I know this tool that kind of rudimentary tools to bring in something new, but 
I, I might need help with that. We, we have docs, we also have mailing yeah. lists. So yeah. okay. the next step will be yeah, emails and the syscall or mailing list. Okay, very good. All right. We are in fact at lunch okay. time, so I, I hate to cut off the conversation, but yeah. um, yes, well, once again, uh, thank you very much for pr presenting this uh, topic, and thank you to everyone who asked questions and participated. So yes, thanks.